Hello, fine people. All right. So we're going to get started in a couple of minutes. We're going to have a little bit of chitty chit chitty chat time. Uh, so usually from the time that we start the stream, it takes about two to five minutes for YouTube to actually send out the notifications. And we are live both on YouTube and Facebook. So that will be fun. All right, and then let me just take a look at this. Let me just send out. Uh, let me just watch on my phone, and then we're going to get started in about two to three minutes. We have lots of cool stuff today. Two, two, two. Although we might be, ah, that is not what I want to do. Home. Notifications. All righty. Subscriptions. Nope. Hold on. What's going on? So I see people are piling in. So we're going to get started in. Just a second. Okay. All righty. All right. So, yes, Matt, uh, I am using my phone just kind of to keep track of things as well. Wow. So I just got the notification that, you, uh, that YouTube sent something out. So we'll get started in right about a second. All right. What's up, everybody? What's up, everybody? Welcome, Squad Squad, and welcome to Slav Guns and our Slav stream. I was looking for a word to add in there for what's happening today, but you know what? I figured we had this on the calendar. We knew it was going to be a S show, uh, but we're going to do it anyway. Uh, we are going to, instead of talking about the upcoming apocalypse or civil war part two. And uh, I did have my uh, bulletproof fest that I was gonna start this out with, but I'm like, it's a little cold here. Um, so we do have an exciting live stream today. I uh, will probably go for about an hour and we do have a special guest and we'll probably have a couple of content creator friends pop on as well. The topic for today is precision rifles. Wait, what else did you expect? Uh, but also, towards the end, we are going to draw the winner of our giveaway from uh, the one that ended uh, December 31st. So we do have a winner. We are going to get a winner live for the Chote stock and a Fix-It Sticks kit. So I'm really excited about that. So let's get started. So today's guest is uh, somebody who I've considered a friend for about a year year and a half or two years now but i finally had a chance to meet him last year uh, when we were at shot show and uh, somebody who supported the channel for a number of companies and his name is matt foster and he's the president of both fmj marketing who represents a number of precision firearms brands that we're all used to such as chote stocks fix it sticks and he's the person to thank for the giveaway, the giveaway for this month. And he's also the president and founder of Catalyst Arms, the company that is responsible for making some very popular accessories for Ruger firearms and probably some others in the near future. So let's bring Matt on and let's talk stuff. <laughs> um, hello, sir. Good evening. Thank you for joining us. Well, thank you for having me. It's uh, obviously been quite an interesting day. So happy to happy to be here well why why not talk about more productive stuff right <laughs> yes, other man. stuff whatever is going to happen is going to happen um but at least this is something to take our minds off of things and somebody is going somebody's going to be really happy in about an hour yes that's a, that's right so right. so for those who are not familiar go ahead introduce yourself and in case I missed anything. <laughs> so my name is Matt Foster. I am the uh, president of FMJ Marketing. I represent uh, actually a number of companies, not all related to precision shooting, but uh, really great companies nonetheless, including Fix-It Sticks, Choke Machine and Tool, uh, Surefeed Magazines, uh, Bighorn Armory, uh, Anarchy Outdoors, 
And I think that's, I think that's it. So for now, yeah. And I'm also the founder and owner of Catalyst Arms. So that about covers it. That would kind of suck if you missed one. I'm like, it was funny. Like when I was at Chop Show and I was talking to, um, oh my God, from USIQ. And I was like, I think you're missing one of the brands. Like, no, no, we went for it. We got them all. So that was cool. Um, so no, one of the topics uh, that you're passionate about is precision rifle shooting. And we we're kind of like, uh, it's funny. It's like, it's January. Right now, we should all be at SHOT Show. Uh, well, not almost. We should be getting ready to go to SHOT Show, but that's not happening, obviously. Um, and then, uh, so my wife is already starting to plant the garden seeds. And that basically means, you know what? It's time to start planning out for the big matches and rifle plans for the following year. And I know you've been doing that yourself. Yeah, it's uh, it's time. As a matter of fact, I already feel like I'm actually sort of behind the eight ball. Um, it always... It always seems to creep up on you. Uh, one of my one of my team. So I I normally shoot the Rifleman Team Challenge out here okay. out west. So that's primarily in Oregon, Washington, um, a few matches in Montana, and so I shoot with uh, the tactical product manager from Loophold, and I also shoot with uh, John Snow from Outdoor Life. And the first match coming up will be the Cold War. I, 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 I didn't plan this. Let's <laughs> get if you're watching. Here you go. I support you guys. <laughs> there you go. So, no, they make a, they make a great product. I mean, I don't I don't have a dog in the fight with them. I just uh, I've used their scopes for years, and and currently I'm I'm running the uh, eight the Mark Five HD on both my uh, six five Ruger Precision Rifle, six five Creedmoor, and the uh, six millimeter Creedmoor. Uh, do have do have the different magnifications? So I do have. Let's have to think about that. I have the five to twenty-five on the six-five Creedmoor, and I have the seven to thirty-five on the six-millimeter Creedmoor. Um, I think if I had to do over again, I might actually just go with only the five to twenty-five. But I'm certainly not going to complain about either scope. So, anyway, so it's funny that you mentioned that because I have the five to twenty-five, and I was thinking I want the seven to thirty-five. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't know, personal preference. I mean. You actually find yourself zooming out quite a bit. Uh, at least yeah. in the matches that I shoot, you know, when you're shooting at the targets like the movers and whatnot at you know anywhere between four and six hundred yards, you know, you're not you're definitely not zooming into thirty five power. So no, absolutely not. Um, you know, and it comes the, the scope comes with a you know with a fairly decent uh, lever on the power selector ring. Yes. So during the match, I mean, time permitting, you will kind of zoom in and zoom out, depending upon how they've hidden the targets and if you need to zoom out to kind of reacquire the terrain and so forth. And the five power is kind of nice to be able to zoom down that low. Which okay. Yeah. It's a little counterintuitive, but it's it's kind of nice. Yeah. So actually, uh, what kind of matches do you shoot, and what are we talking about? So like I said, so uh, I actually, so primarily shoot the Rifleman Team Challenge matches. And they're what we, I, I'm not sure if there's a, a technical name for it as far as the, the format, but uh, we call them sort of more field format or outdoor format matches than, than on a range, for instance. Uh, Cold War Challenge will be on, a, on an actual shooting range that has some long range, uh, you know, areas to, to shoot in. Uh, but primarily, a lot of these matches are out on uh, ranchers' place, you know, private property, canyons, mountains, lots of trees, and and it's really exciting, really fun. I mean, you have to some of the matches you have to hike your gear around all day, so it, you know you sort of start choosing very carefully what you want to throw in your pack. But that's uh, basically that, like for places that actually have places <laughs> to go shoot that far. Yeah. So yeah, well, that's exactly right. Spoiled, spoiled out West. I mean, I think there's, I can look over the calendar. There's at least one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There's at least 10 of these matches, wow. uh, the wrestling team challenge matches. Um, there's a couple so of like a Is there a sanctioning organization around those or now, or like, are we all individual? Well, there is. So, so it is called the Rifleman Team Challenge. I mean, it's, okay. you know, if I don't, I'll have to check. Frankly, I don't know if it's if any of the matches for that. Well, no, they wouldn't count for PRS because they're team matches. Yeah. Um, at least I don't think they would. So, but yeah, I mean, it's pretty much its own body. But it's it's been going for a number of years, and like I say, there's ten to twelve matches on the calendar. They do have a finale wow. at the end of the year. So cool. They keep score, and they you know keep it on practice score. It's now, a, it's are they generally score. all? Um fairly local within the area or are they like all over the country no or these are regional 
Def, definitely regional. So like I say, there's, I believe there's one or two matches in Oregon. Uh, there's at least five matches in Washington, I believe okay. in, in e Northeastern Washington, you know, cause it's wide open and, you know, open country. There's at least two matches in Montana and there may mm -hmm. be one in Wyoming. I'll have to check, but definitely more of a Western regional thing. Cool. But like I, you say, I, I, part of the, you know, it's when you grow up out here, if you have any interest in long range shooting, you can find an area to do it. And so I think that, you know, there's a lot of long range shooters out here. Yeah. Oh, and I totally forgot to kind of go into it. But um, if you guys have questions, just absolutely just leave them in the comments. We will go back for an answer them. And I am keeping track of them. And if there's like something that's explicit, right, perfect timing for the conversation, I'll pull it in, but we'll make sure to answer those. Um, if you are a supporting Squat Squad member, that means you've joined the channel, hit the join button down there in the corner. Um, you'll have an icon that pops up and then I'll make sure that your question is thoroughly addressed and we'll take it up front in front of the line. And same thing, if you want to support the channel, you can feel free to send a super chat, uh, right in the live chat, just hit the dollar sign that's on YouTube. Um, but we are also streaming to Facebook as well and go from there. So one of the questions that is timely that I wanted to bring up is, uh, so it's from Joe Morgan, one of our, hmm. Uh, comment. He's <laughs> one of the uh, what's wrong? He's on every live stream. Um, so are there going to be matches this year given things the way that they are? And that's a great question. Go ahead, Matt. Well, I mean, you know, I, I'm assuming you're talking about probably at least two factors one, COVID, which, yeah. uh, so this, this last year we, uh, you know, we didn't have matches. We had work parties and you had to bring equipment and your equipment couldn't be your, uh, your nails couldn't be anything larger than, uh, you know, 300 wind mag and, uh, your tool belt could only have, could only have certain things. So nice. um, the, the, the COVID thing is not, I mean, it's just been a pain obviously from possible, yeah. uh, you know, travel and hotels and whatnot. Um, as far as you're probably also talking about ammo and, Yes. I mean, as of right now, the plan is obviously to have matches. Most of the guys, you know, like myself, have, I don't know if you can see in the background, I, you know, I've got a little little bit of powder there. Um, you know, have enough powder and, and components to probably get through, you know, well, hopefully at least one season, if, if not two. Yeah. And, you know, then after that, you know, we'll have to see if this ammo and component shortage continues. Yeah. You know, I do remember, I do remember back in, uh, 2013, was it 13 or 14? We had, you know, the ammo shortage and, 13. Uh, three gun, three after gun, the 12 shooting. Yeah. And three gun matches actually started to limit their round count, you know, try to mitigate yeah. them a little okay. bit to help guys out. So, so as of right now, the matches are on, these aren't particularly high round count type scenarios. And like the rifle team challenge matches are usually over two days and the round counts are usually around 200 rounds. I mean, so it's okay. not, you know, not, Gonna that's kill still you. a lot. I mean, that's still a lot for uh, for a rifle round because so coming at it from the USPSA run and gun type pistol stuff, um, the biggest challenge is a lot of the matches were limiting attendance. So you'd typically have a match that would have 50, 60, even up to like 80 people that show up. Uh, but a lot of the clubs were limiting in down to like 25. So most of the matches would require pre-registration and usually it's the same hardcore group of people that generally go the matches. So let's say you have 80 people regularly show up at a match. About 60 of them are the same people that go month to month throughout the area. And when you're limiting it to 25 or 30 people, well, it's going to fill up within literally a matter of within a matter of five to 10 minutes. So that's been the biggest challenge on the more popular pistol matches. Um, I know locally, generally the rifle matches, you can still just go and you can attend and there's really no problems there. Um, but ammo wise, one of the things that people are doing, they are limiting uh, round count just a little bit. Um, but I think it's a good point. I mean, I think most people end up loading their own ammo or have the capacity to or have friends who can do it but i think now more than we saw in 2012 or 2013 is the primer shortage and it's not let me rephrase that 
it's not that there's a lack of primers. There's a lack of primers to meet the unprecedented demand. That's, um, that, that's really what it is. I mean, the manufacturers have not been, have never produced more than what they are now. It's just that the demand is more than two or three times higher than usual. Um, it, it's cleaning. Yeah. It is uh, almost tripped. <laughs> it is uh, getting a little bit better, but it is a concern there as well. All right. So I guess let's go into... I did have some stuff that I wanted to discuss. Um, so let's dive into that. Uh, so this will be the recorded portion. And uh, I might actually break this down. So we're going to, I'll give a nice uh, intro and we'll take all the questions after it. All okay. Right. Do, 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 do. Right. What's up, everybody? Welcome, Squad Squad, and welcome to Slav Guns. I'm glad you. <laughs> Let's try to get. What's up, everybody? Welcome, Squad Squad, and welcome to Slav Guns. I'm glad to have you here, as always. I'm doing this live stream, and I'm going to be joined by an expert in his field, Matt Foster, president of Catalyst Arms and FMJ Marketing. And we're going to be addressing some of the more popular questions that you've had for this channel over the last year or so. One of the most commonly brought up topics and themes is hey, Ooh, I was about to call my name. <laughs> it's like, hey, Slav Guns, I'm glad to have the videos. And it was partly because of your channel that I got back involved with long range shooting. And naturally, that evolves into questions. What type of gun should I start with? What type of shooting do we do? And instead of me chatting here by myself or talking to myself, I decided to have Matt here, <laughs> who has really been focusing in the precision rifle world, who from both the manufacturing side and the shooting side, because he's an active competitor. And we are going to, handle some of these questions one by one and address hopefully some more. So Matt, thanks for ha thank you for coming and joining me here. Well, thank you for, thank you for having me on. It's a question that usually pops up. What does somebody actually need to get started with shooting? And by that, let's say, for example, and we might have to break it down into precision shooting. And then let's say going to the matches such as PRS, NRL 22, and I would say probably separately, we can probably discuss F class. Sure. Well, I mean, gun, ammo, and optics. Uh, I mean, you know, really, it kind of boils. And down. thank you for joining us. That was the answer that you were looking for. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, it's a little bit like saying I want to buy a car. You know, what's it going to cost, or what do I need? I mean, really, it, it kind of boils down to you know what you want to do, and and. You know, one important aspect, which, you know, should never be overlooked is you're probably partly want to do it for fun. So make sure you choose something that you're going to have fun with that you want to shoot um, and just keep your, you know, keep your goals in mind. So, you know, for instance, I mean, if you, you know, date myself, but, you know, back in the day, I mean, if you said long range slash precision rifle, I mean, it was it was almost <laughs> everything was a cookie cutter, right? It was 308, you know, Remington, Remington action, 700 yeah. police. Yeah, yeah, Remington Police, 308, you know, loophole Mark IV scope, you know, that was it. That was your that was your long range setup. That's all you that's all you shot. And you know, fortunately, of course, the field is you know much more diverse now, a lot more options, and really a guy can tailor it any way he wants to. So yeah. I mean, one, you know, one thing to think about is, you know, if somebody wants to get into into long range shooting, for instance, I mean you might actually have something already that you can certainly start with and learn with and, you know, take out and kind of go have fun with before deciding on a whole bunch of new equipment. It's kind of antithetical to being a product guy in the industry, you know, not encouraging going out and buying a bunch of gear right off the bat. But, you know, but really, I mean, for instance, if you have a bolt action 308, even though it's not the latest, craziest, you know, the, the current hottness for cartridges, the 308 is awesome. It's fun to shoot. It's easy to reload. It's accurate. If you've got one, go try to stretch its legs a little bit. I mean, nothing to nothing to lose except burning up some powder and you know bullets and primers, which is kind of precious now, admittedly. But um, yeah, but go have some fun with it first. You know, and a lot of it really applies to matches as well, from the standpoint that if you have a magazine-fed bolt-action rifle in you know some sort of short-action cartridge, because you don't want to beat yourself up with you know, long actions necessarily. Um, yeah, you might just want to try to go shoot, go shoot a match, see what it's like, learn from a little bit, see what other gear out there might suit you best. So, I mean, it's, I, it's, one, it's one way to start. Yeah. I'm glad that you actually brought up the point of having fun because I kind of giggled myself. So 
uh, I started getting involved with firearms because it was fun. At some point, it was fun. And I started getting, I shot out one, two. So I don't have experience with precision rifle matches. I haven't gone done that, but I have extensive experience with handgun matches, everything from the locals up to the nationals. And when you start, it's, yeah, it's absolutely, it's a blast. It's fun. It's about going fast as you can. But then something just clicks and you start taking it seriously <laughs> and it's no longer fun. It's like, all right, how much can I cut off of my draw time or how fast can I get my splits down while still maintaining the two alphas? Or then basically you're ba deciding between yourself, okay, well, what is acceptable timing wise? You're thinking into your head, well, would I just be better off skipping that target at 75 yards and just moving on and taking the penalty on it? At that point, it's not really necessarily fun. Um, and I think with calibers, it, with the rifle world, yeah, I mean, it's absolutely right. I think people just need to kind of go out there and have fun before we possibly commit to taking it into a sport. I, I agree. Um, and again, it's all relative. I mean, if you're, I mean, if, you know, as you pointed out, eventually you might decide that, you know, you're, you're good at it and get really competitive and it's, you know, and it's still fun. I mean, you know, a lot of us had fun, if, you know, even though sports were competitive at the end of the day, it was still fun, even though competitive, you take it seriously. So not, you know, not saying eventually you might not take it seriously, but, you know, but definitely, you know, just go out and try it. If you're, you know, if you're kind of on the fence, you haven't done it before, just go try. Most people are really, you know, very helpful uh, when you're out in the field, help you with gear questions, um, you know, what to use, what not to use. You know, very few guys are trying to push a bunch of gear on you. Oh, you got to go buy a $5,000 rifle or you, or you can't come out here and do this. You just don't see that very often. And, and like I said, there's a tremendous amount to learn, you know, and everybody shoots a little differently. And I mean, if not there, there wouldn't be different cartridges, right? Everybody would shoot the exact same thing, but I mean, you have the six GT and Dasher and you know, BR and six, five Creedmoor. But some, but some would argue and, that those are all the same. What's, what, what's that? <laughs> I'd say some people would argue that. Well, all of yeah, that, that's, that's, that's true. Yeah. Different, different flavors of the same thing, yeah. but, uh, no, but. And it's a great point that you bring up about a lot of the people are being completely welcoming. I remember when I first shot my first rifle match, which was a CMP vintage Garand match. And if you didn't have your own rifle, there are loners there. And I mean, granted, I mean, I am a little bit different. Um, so I decided to shoot it with my Swiss K31 instead of a Garand nice. or 1903 or anything. Uh, but it was fun. And like I said, pretty much any match that you're going to go to, just go out there and say, hey, I'm new. I want to try this out. And people will drop for serious face and there'll definitely be people there who can kind of consider themselves the ambassadors of the sport. They mm -hmm. will take you under a wing. They'll provide the lend, they'll lend you gear if you need to. And there are some matches where literally there are rifles and gear for you to use. And I remember kind of going back to the first CMP match. Um, I didn't have a good enough, um, shooting mat, um, shooting jacket, sling, all that stuff. And like, they're just willing to provide it. And it was awesome. Um, so I think that's going to be universal across most of the matches. I'd say maybe except like if you get yourself, a, if your first matches is a, is a regional or a sectional <laughs> or a national match, eh, that's going to be a little bit, but if you go to a local match, I don't think anyone is going to give you crap for being a newbie. No, no, not at all. And I think, so one of the things, I mean, you, you mentioned long range and things changing over the years. I would say the definition of long range has also changed even over the last 10 years. So I started shooting 14 years ago, started shooting more seriously about 12 or 13 years ago and kind of going back to that definition. Okay. Well go buy a Remington 700 police, mm -hmm. or if you can't get a 700 police, you get a 700 varmint. Um, cause it's almost the same stock, but it's a little bit different. Uh, go federal gold medal match three or weight, 168 ring bullets. And yep. you'd be able to go shoot long range at 300 yards. I would say the definition of long range from those 300 yard days are completely different versus what's, what's considered long and I guess extended long range and I guess even ultra long range today. Oh, without a, without a doubt. I mean, again, you know, you know, quote unquote, you know, back in the day when I was working at Warren scope mounts in the early two thousands, you know, the, 
the holy grail was still that thousand yard shot, right? A thousand yards was precision rifle and long range. Could you shoot it at a thousand yards? And, you know, now to get, you know, these matches out West, most targets are, are inside of a thousand yards, but it is nothing for there to be the, you know, one or two stages that have a target at, you know, 980, 1040, 1130. It's, I mean, and they're tough targets, but, but absolutely that definition of long range. I mean, you know, at the Rapping Team Challenge, most of the moving targets are shot between 400 and 600 yards. Those are the movers. Um, so, yeah, the the gear and the cartridges and the accuracy of, of most of these systems, you know, really just makes it about, frankly, calling the wind and knowing your math math and, uh, and trajectory. So the gear can get you there. So you brought up gear. I think that was a great transition point and kind of get back to our original question. So what besides the gun, besides a scope and ammo um, or a lifeline to your friend who reloads, <laughs> what type of gear would somebody need? Let's say let's define it as going out to shoot past 100 yards for the first time. And let's say with that eventual goal of hitting a thousand yards, what gear or what things would somebody actually need? Sure. I mean, really, you know, really whether you're just going out to shoot long range or shoot a match, I mean, the gear is, you know, basically, you know, basically the same. Obviously, if you're not worried about match constraints, you can take almost anything you want, uh, you know, but you still want to do it in a way that it's more fun than simply like, you know, completely fixing your gun and some sort of, you know, you know, lead sled so that it's just, uh, you know, almost like, you know, shooting a fixed position. Um, I mean, obviously support supports every, when well, I say everything, but supports import, important. Um, you know, front support, rear support, learning how to control the, the movement of the gun. So, you know, first and foremost for hunting, long range shooting and match shooting is uh, probably going to need a bipod, you know, and there's obviously a number of models in the market. Uh, I actually have some on my, on my bench here, but so, you know, one, and I don't have a dog in a fight with any of these, by the way. So, uh, but one that I shoot quite often is this um, Skypod. So, I got this before uh, Skypod was involved with uh, MDT, but this is a this is a real nice bipod. It has a lot of really great features. Uh, one drawback, uh, really the only drawback, basically is the price. These things are about five hundred bucks. Um, real common, uh, probably probably the most common bipod you see out in the precision rifle is the uh, is the Atlas. So uh, this usually hooks a Picatinny rail or some sort of Picatinny to Atlas adapter, or excuse me, Picatinny to Arca adapter. And then uh, occasionally still run, and really one of the best values for the dollar is uh, a Harris bipod. And the only, only dog in the fight I have on this is we make these little levers that go on a Harris. But, you know, regardless of those levers, uh, you know, Harris is a solid bipod. They're still used on, on some of the military, uh, military guns. Um, can be had for usually right around, you know, hundred dollars or 125. And you actually still see a lot of these, uh, out in the field, out, out in the uh, competition section. Okay. So. so I'd say, be, uh, so then I would add, be, you have front support with the bipod, mm -hmm. you'd need a rear bag of some sort. And I guess there's like a lot of different options with that. Yeah, there's, there's a ton of bags. I mean, so. So one of the bags, so I, and I apologize to uh, you know, the guys at Wars Development, I forgot to bring it to my desk. So one of the bags I use is by Wars Development, and it's, uh, I forgot the name of it, but it basically has like four things that can drape over objects. But one of the most common bags out there is the uh, Game Changer by Armageddon Gear. And what guys like about this, of course, is you can drape it over a, you know, a barricade and put your, and actually, you know, a small barricade like that. But a lot of guys now are turning them on the side and getting a lot more surface area for their uh, for their gun to lay across. And uh, you know, so if you have a because I can't touch a gun, right? So you know, you just lay your gun right across it. Your magwell comes down, and and it gives a nice nice support. Um, this what people like about this bag is that also it's it's really easy to use as a rear bag. So if you're shooting okay. off a bipod, you can either, you know, put the butt stock here. And again, you can turn it almost any way you need to, to get the correct height that you need. So if you had to have one bag, you'd be really hard pressed not to uh, look at one of these game changers. Yeah. And that's actually, that's perfect demonstration of what one of those types of bags can do. So that's awesome. Um, so one of the things kind of going back, since you said you brought it up towards the front and you had a rail there that has Swiss Arca on there. Um, 
you see a big trend right now of people starting to use tripods as opposed to bipods. Correct. Yeah, so, so you're seeing a number of things. You're seeing guys uh, shoot, clamp their gun directly into a tripod. And bear with me just one moment. See if I can knock everything over. So this isn't the tripod that I shoot from. But right now I'm using, a lot of guys use some uh, stuff by Really Right Stuff. Uh, I use this, uh, I think it's a LH55 from uh, Leo Photo. But basically, it's just a great big ball and socket joint, and you clamp your gun directly into this arc or rail clamp, okay? So if you have an arc or rail in the bottom of your stock, or like our hand guard, you simply cinch that in, and now you're, you're locked in place. So you can swivel your gun pretty much anywhere you need to, and now you're supported by a full tripods so a lot of guys will shoot these kneeling standing up um it's 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 a pretty nice well it's a really nice system and of course you can slide your gun pretty much the entire length of it anywhere you need to okay. so here's basically a question and obviously it's all about barrel harmonics kind of like at that point and having something that's repeatable so if you're looking at a tripod versus a bipod i mean mm -hmm. the d dynamics are going to be very very much different so with a bipod you're either loading into it and the gun goes straight back I've shot a little bit off of a tripod, but I don't remember enough about it, nor have I had a need for it yet. But how does that change with point of impact shooting off of a tripod where essentially you're trying to get the gun stable? Like, does the tripod fly back or what happens with that? It depends. I mean, it, you know, it is kind of like loading a bipod. Everybody loads a bipod differently, yeah. right? Whether they really mash into it or just gently take some slack out of it. So a lot of it's going to depend on how you shoot from the tripod. Um, you know, most guys will, I shouldn't say most guys. I mean, I've seen guys and myself included will, you know, will bear into it a little bit, but really more than loading it, what you're trying to do is just take out any wobble or, you know, movement as you're trying to, you know, as you're trying to stay on target, particularly if you're standing. Um, you know, a lot of times with guys, again, I shouldn't say a lot of times, my experience, what I've seen some guys do is really try to not put, put much pressure on it at all because the tripod really is supporting your entire gun. I mean, you literally could walk up and just basically kiss the stock with your shoulder and squeeze the trigger. You, know, you wouldn't have to actually grab it. So you try not to impart too much, um, you know, torque into the gun, just like anything else. When it goes off, it doesn't want to, you know, go one direction. So, yeah. Uh, and generally, though, so I mean, you're going to be using tripod, you're going to be using it, well, other or shooting sticks, you're going to be using more in hunting type situations or a PRS type match. I think unless you have a disability, you're generally not going to be standing and shooting, you'd shoot prone when you start going out long distance, in which case you would be using a bipod and a rear bag. Yeah, most likely. I mean, a bipod's probably still your optimal position for shooting, you know, long range. I mean, most of the pictures I've seen of the guys doing like, you know, king of two mile and stuff, they're certainly prone on a bipod. So that probably tells you something. There you go. That's a good way of thinking about it. So what we're discovering so far, so basically at a minimum, you would need a bipod. You would need, you would need a bipod. You should have a rear bag of some sort instead of just trying to pocket it into your shoulder. If you want to have extras, that's when you go either with a fancier bipod that would allow you to have more adjustments mm -hmm. or something with a Swiss Arca that you can take in and off, on and off quickly or change it between the guns. And then a tripod if your game calls for it or if you have a need for it specifically. Yeah, but the tripod as far as need, I mean, again, talking about like just real, you know, basic needs, I mean, I'm not sure. I'm not sure how many anymore. How many matches you really have to have a tripod? There's a lot that it's nice, and there's one match in the, in the rifling team challenge that you know almost turns into a tripod match. So it's kind of interesting, but you know, but really at a at a you know sort of the bare minimum. If you've got your you know your rifle set up, it's you know you're happy with the accuracy. Uh, you know you like your optics. You've got a good bipod you're comfortable with that you can shoot well from, and it's high enough to possibly get, you know, over some grass or, you know, adjust for your shooting positions. I mean, really, then you just need a good bag because um, a bag is what you're going to use, you know, again, like this game changer or one of the ones about like Warhorse development. That's what you're going to use, um, you know, off of barricades or off of a rock for instance, you know, the, you know, the way the bags are designed, like if you have an asymmetrical rock with a point on it, 
you know, you can basically just if I make my elbow into point, but you can basically kind of drape that bag, you know, over over a point and give your rifle something, you know, something to, to rest on and put your mag, mag well up against this. And that's partly where, you know, later on as you get, you know, more gear and kind of figure out what you need, then you start worrying about the balance of your rifle, whether or not you actually add weight, which, you know, if you're a hunter, that sounds really counterintuitive, right? <laughs> but, you know, in these guns, you want them balanced so that basically you can set it on this bag or on a barricade and it basically doesn't wobble either way. So, because you don't want to be trying to hold the gun up as you're shooting off a barricade, trying to keep it on target, you want that gun balanced when it's on the barricade. Cool. All right. So then, one question that usually pops up. So I'm thinking, I was referring back to a video I saw previously about what gear do you need to shoot in the PRS match, and then you'd have things such as binoculars, a laser rangefinder, a wind meter of some sort, a yeah. ballistics calculator of some sort. So let's discuss those items. Sure. I mean, what do you actually need? What is nice to have? And I guess at a, at what point would you need uh, some of those items? Well, you're definitely gonna need a rangefinder. Uh, you know, not all some matches will give you the range. That's great. You know, you walk up to the stage and the range of the targets may be there. Uh, at least some of these matches, uh, you you know, part of part of what you're doing is actually ranging on the clock. So you've got to you know find some of them. You have to find the target, uh, but most you know, the targets are here, they point them out. And then on the clock, you range them, you know, get your dope basically, then then shoot the targets. So you want a decent range fight. You don't have to have, you know, the best on the planet, but you're going to want something that reaches out probably 1,200 yards or more um, that you can accurately range. And you're going to want to also practice, you know, putting it on, on your tripod or kneeling down in a way that you can hold it steady because you really want to get an accurate range, in particular when you're talking to targets that are basically like 800 yards and beyond, where when you range it, if you're, you know, if you miss, if you don't estimate the range correctly, you know, plus or minus, you know, 30, 40 yards, you know, could be a miss. So, you know, so a range finder, you know, really at a minimum. As far as the ballistic calculators, I mean, I've... Josh, I'm, Matt, I'm going inter to interject for a second. So just kind of for those who might who haven't caught on. So, I mean, we're talking literally if you need a range finder for a PRS type match or you're shooting a match or you're going out there and you don't know the distance to the target. Right. Um, if you're going, if you're, let's say, for example, you're shooting an F-class rifle match, well, you you know what uh, distance to that target is or if you're going to go to your range and you know it's at a 1,000 yards, it's at a 1,000 yards. Um, so I would say basically a range finder is going to be a requirement at a PRS match, but if you're just going out to shoot, or if you're gonna you want to go hit your first thousand yard target, you and you know the distance, you're probably not going to need it of sorts. Or unless you're one of those really awesome people and your scope reticle has a range finding and you know the size of the target, and then you can do it the old fashioned way. And some matches make you do that, and I always hate those stages, uh, but they're fun. So, you know, and probably it's probably worth backing up. I mean, you know, taking some things for granted, but obviously one of the first steps, of course, is after you've got your, your rifle ammo and optics and, and bipod and back um, is you have is you really, you know, you need to know your, your ammo's velocity. Um, ballistic coefficient, basically all those variables to, you know, at some point in time, you, you do have to get your, you know, get your data to hit targets at the range. Now, whether or not later on you carry a calculator with you, that's actually a separate subject. But at some point, as well as is getting your data, your dope, your, which you're going to want to verify. So you really need to have accurate velocity numbers and an accurate ballistic coefficient to, to start to develop that solution. At least it makes it a little bit easier. Cool. Um, all right, so basically you would need a, possibly a chronograph because obviously you can't go off of what the box of ammo says. You do need to know right. what it is for your particular gun. And then honestly, even if you're hand loading and you're looking at the book, here is a dirty little secret with those ballistic coefficients. Some manufacturers lie. <laughs> and the ballistic coefficient that's advertised is actually not what the ballistic coefficient is. Um, I do know Hornady is actually pretty good with that because they do give the BC over at a certain distance. So those are pretty good. But there are a lot of um, companies out there who advertise, oh, we have the highest BC, but it's not. It's definitely not. All right. So rangefinder, nice to have. 
And the chronograph, frankly, I mean, normally you can find somebody to borrow one from. I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't list that as one of the needs. I would say the need is to get your data. So, you know, find, find, a, friend with a, chronograph, find a friend with a chronograph with a lab radar. That'd be great. Cool. Um, good set of binos or like any other equipment besides a scope. Or if you yeah. have a ring finder, do you still need a pair of binos? Yeah, I mean, it helps. I mean, again, it depends on the match. I mean, some of these matches uh, where the target acquisition is part of it, it definitely helps. You know, that way, when they're doing the stage brief, you can look through the binoculars, you can get a lay of the land, you get to see the obstacles that are in the way. Uh, and frankly, you can also start looking at the trees and the grass or water downrange to start to see what the wind might be doing. So don't, you know, you can't ever take that for granted that what the wind is doing at you that it's doing the same thing out in front of you, you know, 300, 500 and 800 yards. Yeah. So then the guess along the same lines is does somebody actually need a ballistics calculator or like a Kestrel, which is both a ballistics calculator and a wind meter? Hmm. I mean, and, I, uh, and, and let's break it down between, so let's break it down between somebody going to shoot thousand yards for the first time. And then, somebody who's taking it more seriously and might find themselves in a match environment. Yeah. I mean, obviously if you just want to go out and shoot and, and, you know, learn a little bit, you don't, you don't have to have one. And I mean, you know, I mean, guys estimated wind, obviously before there were, you know, before there were wind meters, you know, you can kind of develop your, you know, your own sort of way of, of gauging the wind. When I used to paraglide a lot, you know, a lot of times we just sort of said, okay, the, you know, the wind's roughly five miles an hour. Um, it's obviously going to help, help to have a, help to have a wind meter. But frankly, I mean, I've, I've seen guys shoot matches where they basically in, in the match prep leading up to it, you know, got their data, have, you know, really great charts and basically shoot the entire match basically off of the data on a, on an arm coach. Um, they were experienced enough to, you know, kind of know the wind and know they need to, you know, hold 0.1 mils or, you know, 0.3 mils, you know, into the wind um so it's it definitely would help but i mean i wouldn't be you know i wouldn't say well you can't go shoot a match if you don't have one cool and i guess it'd also make a difference if you're shooting long range versus elr because even if you miscalculate the wind by one or two miles an hour at four or five hundred yards it's going to be a lot less significant than you miscalculating it out at 1500 or even 2000 yards Oh, without a doubt. Yeah. Cool. All right. So let's move on kind of like to the next topic at hand, which is, all right, well, hold on. Let, do we miss any gear? What else do we miss? Well, I mean, there's <laughs> a, a shooting mat. No, there's, you, you won't need a shooting mat. And most of the time you're not going to have time to, you know, put a shooting mat down. If it's really crappy terrain, they might have a mat already in place. For PRS. Uh, for PRS, I'm sorry. Yeah, for when you're out doing <laughs> yourself, yeah, you actually want to have a shooting man. Nothing, nothing says fun like kneeling down on a cactus or a uh, or a sharp rock. So, you know, shooting shooting mats are uh, definitely definitely nice to have. You know, I brought brought some of my stuff up. I and mean, as far as like you know what you need, um, you know, brought. I did bring my Kestrel. And again, I mean, if you if you can get into you know get into a Kestrel, um, it's actually a lot of fun to have, and you'll and you'll learn a tremendous amount from it because you can shoot, and if it you know you can see what the wind's doing, and start to learn what your cartridge is doing. Um, for PR, you know, again for matches, you are going to need some manner of of keeping track of your of your data and targets. So what a lot of guys do, uh, myself included, is I basically have uh, an arm coach. So this is this is this is my uh, pack, by the way, for shooting PRS matches. Mm -hmm. So uh, it has a gun scabbard. Lately, I've actually just been carrying the gun and just you know keeping all my gear, ammo, and food because you know I didn't get this way by missing too many meals. Uh, keep the food in the pack. But so this is this is a little admin pouch, and this is what I have a lot of sort of like you know some of the necessary little doodads. So here's here's some data. So here's my arm coach that I wrote down a couple targets from the last match. Okay. So just wear that on the arm. And then as you range the targets, you write down the data. Um, you know, I write down the range first, and then, then look at my chart. And unless the weather has gone really off, you know, like I'll go to a match and I'll, I'll get the altitude of where we're shooting. 
you know, what the, what the weather's roughly going to be and, and probably print out a new chart. You know, unless it's like 30, 40 degrees lower than what I anticipated, the data is going to be fine for most targets. And then you take that data, write it down. Then as you're shooting, uh, you know, basically, you know, adjust your scope or use the reticle holdover. Um, so you want to have something to write on that. Uh, so usually a grease pencil in case it's raining or a wet erase marker. Uh, I got it mistaken for a um, dry erase marker once. That was fun. I wrote down all my data. And by the time I sort of wiggled into position, I put my arm against something and all the data had been erased off. That was fun. Um, you know, uh, you know, boar snake, you know, not, not, uh, you know, premium cleaning gear, but awful handy out in the field. And then, uh, some right in rain paper is also uh, really good to have out of the match. Very cool. Where is your fix it sticks kit? Uh, fix it sticks kit is usually either in the main pack or it's, uh, back of the vehicle. There you go. All right, so uh, let's move on from the gear. Let's talk about some of the guns. Uh, one of the questions it really brings up, and I've had a lot of conversations, and I'm sure there's probably opinions about this, is what should somebody start with? Um, should somebody go the route of just going out and buying a factory gun? Do we need to have something like a factory custom gun, such as the Ruger Precision Custom, the Ruger Custom Shop Ruger Precision Rifle, um, and I know Savage now makes the elite precision guns or just go all out and just get a fully custom gun, build it yourself or get a gunsmith. Well, that is a good question. Um, fortunately, it's a uh, it is absolutely a buyer's market when it comes to firearms. I mean, so whether so what should you buy one? I mean, like I say, one you know, you might actually have something you can use, but if you decide you want to buy a rifle and, and uh, to get into it, you know, the Ruger precision rifle is a, is a really great route to go. It's very, you know, you can dress it up almost any way you want. Uh, Savage. I mean, whether you buy their off the shelf competition rifle or buy one that basically just accepts any sort of box magazine, uh, Savages are very accurate. You actually see a number of sav Savages out in the field. Um, It'd be easy to, you know, put together anything with a Remington footprint, like a Hawa, for instance. Um, there's a number, you know, obviously with a Remington footprint, there's any number of stocks you can get. But there's, but off the shelf, I mean, uh, you know, there's actually been some guys that have been out uh, competing with Ruger American Predators. I mean, literally just off the shelf as is. So, you know, you can find a gun that you can go out and have fun with and not feel like the gear was, was basically responsible for you not doing well. And I know that's one of the questions that pops up. I mean, like, I think a lot of people, like, they're anxious to get into it. So, like, they buy up all the gear and then they decide to, like, they feel like they have to spend a lot of money. I'm listening. I'm coming back. No, you're good. <laughs> um, so, you have a lot of people who have the need that they feel like they need to go out there and spend a lot of money to buy a gun. And it, there is a conversation. There's somebody that I know that we were discussing, his dad, who wanted to get back into long-range shooting. And my suggestion was, hey, you know what, buy, go out, buy a Ruger American or a Hava 1500, learn to shoot with it, and then basically decide what is it that you need, what is it that you like, based on your preferences, then go out and build something else. What if you do? He goes out there and he spends $5,000 buying a high-end chassis, a high-end um, custom receiver, and uh, be, a, having him spin up a high-end Bartling barrel and trigger. So he's spending $5,000 on a gun. And my argument, it's not necessarily that it's a bad gun. It's just, well, what do you know? What are your preferences? Because So you'll see it next Monday. I have a video where we discuss this a little bit more. And it's like, OK, well, it's not, one of the questions that'll pop up is, OK, well, should I get a Ruger precision rifle or a Ruger Hawkeye long range target or a Savage or a Hawa. And my answer is, well, it depends. I mean, like, do you have a preference for a two lug or a three lug? Do you want push feed or controlled round feed? Do you care whether your rifle takes AICS or AW mags, or do you want it to run off of SR 25 mags? All of that is going to make a difference. And then you're talking about, okay, well, does it need to have a quick change barrel system? Um, 
do you want or do, are you just comfortable with it having a jam nut like a regular rifle and until you kind of have a preference or you know what the answer is to those questions get a regular rifle and learn to shoot on that before you go and spend a lot of money on something that you might end up finding out that you're unhappy about and i think so. that's and i think it's actually a great way to do it because again you know, you can, there's any of a lot, say any, but there's, there's a number of those rifles on the market. Again, the, you know, the Ruger American Predator, Ruger American, I guess just in general, um, you know, the Savage, how, uh, um, I'm not sure. Is anybody making a, making a chassis for like the, the TC, like the compass or the venture? I, I'm not entirely sure. So there aren't, um, there are no chassis as far as I'm aware for the venture line, except the TC LRR, which is the factory made one. Okay. Um, you do have chassis for the Ruger American, which is the MDT chassis. You for the Howas, you do have. You have the Tikas. I think that's the big one that you you left off of your list. Um, you have those Tika fanboys, um, and then even uh, Mossberg uh, Patriot does True. have a couple of chassis out there as well. And I did just finally, I just got done filming with a Patriot, and I put up a picture on Instagram uh, of that gun, and I was honestly for 350 bucks i was pretty dang impressed with the factory action on the patriot um and that could also be an option as well so i guess my preference would be hey you know what buy something that you can then yep. once the gun is holding you back exactly. and you know how it's holding you back upgraded upgraded with something like this so it's not completely in the camera there you go so this is a chote stock that i have for a howa 1500 action yeah, and that's, I mean, that, that is a good segue. It's going to seem like the, you know, the plug, and I apologize. But, yeah, so and this is this is one of those. I, this is probably, this might be the other half of your stock, by the way, um, Bob. So. <laughs> yep, it might be. <laughs> so, I was going to say, I, I think I, I have the other half then. <laughs> no, but it's, you know, but the, but the point's well taken. You can buy any one of those rifles. Uh, they're They're fairly inexpensive. I mean, I would never sit there and, you know, try to make it sound like, ah, you know, four hundred dollars is nothing, but you know, but it's fairly certainly less than some of the custom actions that are out there, or all the custom actions. And yeah, you can put it in in a, in a stock if that's your preference. There's chassis form, and you can you can really just kind of put it together the way you want it. And I actually saw one of the comments, um, but that's exactly it. Is you know you you probably want to see how you shoot, what your preference is, uh, you know, before getting into the, you know, the multi thousand dollar custom action, because maybe you want something different. Maybe you don't want to shoot six creed more. Maybe you don't want to shoot six GT. Um, and then once you're locked, you know, once you buy one of those custom actions, granted, you can, you can change out the barrel, but you know, you're a lot of money into that by the time you've got a custom action, a chassis or a manners or Macmillan stock to drop it into the barrel that you've purchased, muzzle brake, you know, on and on. And then go, eh, maybe that's not exactly what's right for me. Not that it's not great, but maybe it's not right for you. And again, if everybody shot everything exactly the same, you wouldn't see any diversity out on the field. But you do a lot. Yeah. So, uh, and I think kind of like what makes it exciting right now. So, I mean, it, it, the old advice used to be get a Remington 700 police because then. When you wanted to upgrade that, you'd be able to put it into a Macmillan stock or a Bell and Carlson stock or like a, another high end stock. You kind of still have the same thing, but now you don't have to buy a Remington 700 police. You can just buy a Howell barreled action or a Savage barreled action or even like the cheapest Ruger American and then throw that into a different type stock. And I think some of the companies were kind of going, I mean, you have the Ruger um, Ruger Precision Rifle, which is a little bit different, although it is based on the American action, which is that action in a chassis. And then you kind of have the semi-cost custom route, such as that guy, which is the custom shop where they do upgrade the barrel, they do upgrade a few parts. And then the other newest line in that would be the Savage Precision and the Savage Elite Precision where they're already going out there for you and putting their action into an MDT chassis. So it'll it basically saves you one step before then kind of going into the custom shop, well, the custom guns, where you literally call up a gunsmith or call up a GA Precision and be like, hey, this is what I want on it. Sure. No, that's, I mean, that makes, that makes sense. Um, 
No, it's like I say, fortunately, I mean, frankly, it's really a buyer's market out there. Uh, you know, one thing, and the reason why a lot of guys change out the stocks on them is, you know, the Ruger American is a fantastic gun and so are the Savages, for instance. But, you know, usually the, you know, the beginning or the, the synthetic stocks are pretty soft. And, you know, if you look at, you know, like if you made a list of the top 10 things that contribute to accuracy, you're probably not going to find squishy stock on that list. So, you know, that's why a lot of guys upgrade to a chassis or to a different stock, whether it's a higher grade composite stock, uh, you know, some sort of, uh, or excuse me, polymer stock or a composite stock or a chassis. So, yeah. So, and, and that's going to be a good segue. So 10 years ago, we really didn't have chassis guns. I mean, or at least, I mean, I'm sure there were a couple, but they weren't as hot of a topic as they are right now. So you have even taken a look at the Ruger line, you have the same guns, you have some in the wood stock and you have some in a metal chassis. Uh, let's talk about pros and cons. And I guess I would say you, then you have something like this, which is a hybrid. Mm -hmm. um, pros, cons, what's your take? What should somebody look for? What do you see on the shooting circles? Oh, I see a lot of, I see a lot of personal preference. Um, you know, That's not what we're looking for. We're looking for you to make a determinant, uh, take a determinant. Yeah, position. yeah. I'm kidding. No, no. no I know. It's, is, I mean, personal really preference I mean, is the see, correct you, answer. You, uh, you see, you see a lot of, uh, you know, I say traditional style stocks. You know, and I would say traditional target style stock, right? You know, the more vertical grip, because this is what a chassis basically approximates, right? It gives you the, you know, these these kinds of stocks were available long before the chassis were. So it gives you the the pistol grip, which is more comfortable for you know, precision rifle shooting uh, gives you the, you know, when it's not cut in half, gives you the, the wide forend and a flat forend for resting on bags and so forth. Um, and of course, usually, and some would have an adjustable cheek piece to give you the, the perfect eye relief and eye realignment for, you know, for shooting and possibly even a hook like this, um, you know, in a wide surface for, for riding on the bat for using a rear bag. So, and then chassis came along and chassis have the benefit. What guys like about chassis is they're modular. Right. So you can swap out the grips and there's a number of grips on the market, uh, butt stocks and there's different, you know, butt stocks available for the chassis. Some take AR-15 style butt stocks, some have proprietary, not, well, proprietary, but other guys have made butt stocks to fit them. Uh, M-lock slots along the side for adding weight or a night vision bridge over the top or, you know, adding uh, spuds to attack your magneto speed, uh, a chronograph. So guys like that modularity and it becomes kind of building your own gun. You buy, you know, this custom action from Curtis and you buy an MPA chassis and, and you buy a barrel from somebody and you put it all together, a grip and, and, you know, and you probably have a really fantastic shooting setup. So that's part of what the appeal of the chassis was. One of the things that people, I shouldn't say people, but, you know, sometimes ordering a synthetic stock isn't quite as simple. You know, the, the lead time may be fairly large at a place like, you know, some some of the manufacturers have a fairly large lead time. Uh, often it's it's still recommended that you probably bet them. And, uh, you know, so they fit the action perfectly. And so the chassis were kind of nice because really a lot of guys just started dropping them in and shooting. Now, some guys have started betting the chassis anyway, a, a little bit, you know, but almost like skin betting. They basically still will put a little bit of betting compound, cinch the action down, and, and then everything's a, you know, 100% perfect fit. You know, is there any benefit to doing that with something with a, you know, with a, with an aluminum chassis? I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. Um, like for me personally, I mean, you know, using this stock by, you know, by my client Choate, for instance, it has, I mean, it has literally an aluminum chassis. So it's more than a bedding block. It literally has this chassis down the full length. You know, I put a number of actions in these stocks, whether it's their ultimate sniper stock or their ultimate varmint stock or these tactical stocks. I've never betted them. You know, they're they're kind of a V block configuration. So the action basically self centers in the V block. And if you, uh, you know, properly torque the action and I was not trying to segue to fix, fix it sticks. But that's all, all often an overlooked component is is torquing the action screws to the to the specification. Uh, torque it down and you're going to be fine. If you wanted to skim bed it, which is just a, and I think I mentioned, you know, just a thin, thin coat of bedding on, on the aluminum surface where you cinch it down to take up any voids. That's fine. I'm just not sure it gets you anything, but that's just, I and mean, that's just my personal opinion. 
Yeah. And that's actually a great reminder. Um, I, I would say a lot of the issues that are related to accuracy, I would say a lot of them are not due to bad equipment, but simply people failing to torque down either over scope rail or over action screws. And I got to say, so actually one of the guns that I was testing re recently, I took it out using the fix it sticks kit. The action screws were like very, very loose and there's a little bit of wobble. And with the Thompson Center LRR, great gun. Uh, but I went out to the range and all of a sudden I see my groups are like going from sub one inch out to like two and a half. And I'm like, I'm going crazy. I'm like, is it my loads? What's going on? And then I touch the scope and the whole thing just turns oh. over. And I had both the action screws were loose and the scope base was loose on that gun. Um, so, and it, this is actually a good plug for your video. So Matt does have a couple of videos out there uh, that will tell you how to set up your rifle before you go shoot it. So don't just take it out of the box, stick a scope on there, make sure everything is properly set up because it, they are still put together by humans. And oftentimes they'll probably not have the correct torque specifications on them. Yeah, it's, and, it's, not, it's not a dig at the factory. It's just, it's, it's worth going through and just making sure everything's exactly the spec. It's, uh, it's worth the five, 10 minutes it'll take you to go through and, and uh, put a little oil underneath the scope base, properly torque it down, tighten the action screws, you know, tighten any other fasteners to the specification. You'll be glad you did. Yeah. And especially think about it. It's not even just the time perspective. It's the money aspect. So when I was, I wasted probably 40 or 60 rounds of 308 about a year ago until I found out that, Hey, the, everything was loose. So it was, um, so it was so almost free a year ago. Now you wasted like $500 worth of ammo. Yeah. So I was just thinking like, you know, like right now I'm, I was testing out with a six, five PRC gun and it would, I mean, like you shoot two boxes, that's $120 right there. Um, yeah, no kidding. So that's something that definitely comes up. So kind of like along the same lines, I think uh, right now, recently we had books. I think that's how you pronounce it. They kind of have a fusion of wood and chassis. Have you played with that? I have not. It looks really nice. It's a nice, I mean, it looks really good. Yeah. Uh, so I'd say one thing I know like people will bring up is where you're shooting the gun because having a wood or rubber riser on your cheek is a lot better than having metal when it's mm. cold or hot, I would say. Yes, no doubt. Yeah. So besides the modularity aspect to chassis, are there any other reasons, pros and cons to having something like a chassis versus a traditional stock? And I guess one thing I would say is weight possibly. That'd be easier to add weight to a chassis than a stock. Yeah, I think it, I mean, you know, it's easier to add almost anything to a chassis just because of the various attachment points. Uh, a lot of the stock manufacturers have actually responded, though. I mean, you're actually seeing some of the composite stocks with some M-lock slots. Um, you know, fastest on the bottom, like the choke stock, for instance, does have an Anschutz rail on the bottom. So you actually there are a number of attachments you can slide in. Uh, I'm having it work on our attachment, by the way. Um, go figure, right? The, uh, I mean... I do think it was the modularity and putting it together yourself that sort of became the appeal. And frankly, I think there's also a little bit of the looks of the, of the looks to it. Um, some guys just absolutely prefer a traditional stock feel and look. I mean, if there's, if there's very distinct advantages one way or the other, I'm not exactly sure I would know what they are because I mean, you can add weight to both. You can balance out the, you know, you can back each one. You can balance out the rifle, you know, where you want the balance point. And again, I, I do think a lot of it does come back down to uh, personal preference and feel. So, um, I mean, right now I'd say it's, I'm not sure it's exact 50, 50, but it kind of seems like it. I mean, you see a lot, you see a lot of guys shooting stocks. You see a lot of guys shooting chassis. And I think it probably depend on the sport as well. So I'm thinking watching the latest videos of King of two miles, all those guys are using custom stocks. I would say the F class people are shooting stocks. And it's in the PRS where it's going to be more, more um, chassis. And I guess part of it would probably be MDT and other chassis companies sponsoring the hell out of those matches. And, well, I want a chassis. That or it's all a setup to make AR-15 Legos 
to bolt action rifle Legos. And that's really what I think a chassis could be. And I think you're right. I think that's actually a lot of what chassis were, were sort of a little bit of that AR-15 motif and sort of mindset of pertaining to rifles. And the PRS and certainly the field format matches out here are a little bit more of a quote-unquote action sport or a little bit more dynamic yeah. uh, than, you know, than F-Class or ELR where, you know, you're prone, you're on a firing line, you're just shooting. You know, these matches, you're you're putting a gun in and out of barricades and ports and shooting off of tires and rocks and you know, kind of almost anything you can think of. So I think, again, a lot of guys did like that modularity of a chassis because you might be able to, you know, slide a bipod back uh, all the way to the magwell, for instance. Yeah. Whereas, uh, you know, unless you specifically set up, uh, you know, your rifle stock to have an arc rail somehow fastened to the bottom yeah. of it, that's not necessarily possible. Yeah. Now, here's a question. Does it have any impact on accuracy? Ooh. Well, <laughs> boy, there's the... <laughs> There's a loaded question. Uh, I honestly don't know. I mean, obviously, there yeah. are some guys that are, I mean, phenomenal shooters, you know, in the league that, you know, take first and second place every time and they're shooting chassis and same the guys that shoot stocks. So yeah. it, it probably is six to one half a dozen of the other. Um, I mean, I'd say the only thing you can possibly think of is with a chassis, you're generally not going to have a need to bet it versus if you do get a stock that would benefit from getting bedded. Yeah, and, we, and I talked about that earlier. I mean, I think yeah. I, I think part of the allure of the chassis is that you can you know, essentially assemble it yourself and expect, you know, amazing accuracy. Whereas, you know, the composite stocks, because they're routed on, a, you know, they're routed with a CNC and not in, you know, the clearance is clearance. Whether something's not touching by a thousand seven inch or ten thousand seven inch, it's still not touching. So I think when you get a composite stock, I think you still actually kind of want to bet it. So there's an extra step and, you know, betting's a little scary. I mean, you know, the thought of epoxying your, your action into your stock is, you know, horrifying. <laughs> so ask me how I know. Um, so, you know, it's uh, like I say, I think the modularity and just be able to cinch it together is, has a strong appeal. I would say, and it kind of like to wrap that con the conversation up would be, Look, it's like if you're a new shooter, just go get a decent gun and go shoot. Yep. And then you'll figure out your preferences. And all of the minutiae we're talking about, stocks versus chassis, all that, well, that's going to depend on if you're playing a game and the rules of the game, or then largely what your preferences are. Otherwise, we'd all be driving Toyota Camrys and Ford Explorers. No, I think you're exactly right. And I mean, and, you know, and I'm not going to how to phrase this properly. It's like, I'm not, I'm not saying this just because, because they're my client, but for instance, to your point, you know, yeah, go, you know, go buy, go buy a good action and then, you know, go buy, go buy a decent stock. You know, I mean, this, this stock retails for, you know, 200 bucks and you know, you're, you're in the game. You know, you want to make sure your gun is in, in a stable platform, preferably not in the, the, the squishy Tupperware, Tupperware stock. Uh, but but there's also a lot of great stocks out there. So, you know, check out the Cho, check out the Magpul. Um, you know, there's a lot of great stock options. Did I just say that? I did not mean that pun. Um, but there's a lot of great options available for, for most of those actions to put them in and have a, a really great gun to start with. All right. So, Matt, thank you for joining me. This was actually a great video, kind of looking and discussing some of the questions that a lot of you have had. And I know there are a lot of newer shooters who are getting into the long range or longer range, longer range game. And these are the questions that you had. And obviously, there are no stupid questions. Now, you might think that some of the questions might be silly and people are afraid to ask. Don't be. If you have a question, just ask. And most every gun guy out there will want to address those for you because it's literally it's all about the numbers and the number of gun owners that are there so matt thank you for joining me You're welcome and that's the video i'll make sure to see you in the next video unless you're hanging around and you're live and now we're going to do all the questions that we I'll, have I'll hang, I'll hang for questions if if you want all right yeah so let's do questions and then we're going to draw our winner i'm not sure what your time frame is oh i'm good all right not going drinking today now that your state capital is burning. They yeah. they breached the governor's mansion in uh, in Olympia. Yeah, no, my we're Oregon, so we're you know. 
Oh yeah, wrong state. They'll, they'll call out the Garden Defender Mansion, but not downtown. It's all those big square states. All right, so let's go through these questions. <clears throat> Sounds cool to have a match with the mountain peppered with targets. That is cool. I mean, you guys, so there's one range out here in the East Coast, which is Sheepdog Warrior in Catskill, New York, that does have that. But it's cooler out West. Definitely. I mean, yeah, it's, it's, one, it's one of the things that actually keeps me here is is the shooting the mountains you know the ocean but uh, yeah it's shooting a match in natural terrain where we have targets that are you know and there there is one match we shoot where they actually i mean they won't put the target behind anything and it's always it's always 100 percent visible but they do put the targets in the trees there's one stage where they wow. actually they usually hang a target up in the tree i don't even know how they got it there but it's it's like 30 feet up in this pine tree it's uh, it's crazy so it's kind of fun very so here's actually a question for out there are most of the places that you're shooting you're shooting up against the mountain or down into the valley or are there just basically large swaths of land yeah we have got targets like at the apex of a hill and skyline it and no I'm kidding um no there we we shoot basically a lot into the hillsides but it's so it's so mountainous um you know so mountainous out here that's really easy to at least out in those areas you know to find canyons where you know, you'll, you know, put the targets, you know, up along a hillside. There's, there's almost always a backstop. It's not, it's not usually a situation where it's just so vast that the bullet's not going to travel far enough to do anything. Well, I would say basically it kind of from the perspective of if you're shooting a match to be able to spot, if you're shooting into the hillside, it's going to be easier to spot your misses because it's going to have a splash. So I was watching some of the videos from there's, Russia. There's no brush. Yeah. Okay. And like I said, they're shooting out in like plain fields and like, Unless it's directly by the target, you're not seeing a, you don't know where it's going. Yeah, no, and that's exactly right. I mean, there's, there are some targets where it's really easy to see. And that's, and that's part of, you know, and, you know, we probably skipped one little step about cartridge selection uh, for shooting a match, which we can, you know, do a deep dive on that later. Six but more, what's there to discuss? Uh, yeah, start. Uh, anyway. <laughs> But, but the bottom line is, yeah, partic particularly if you're shooting a match that's not in a team format where you don't have a teammate to help you spot, part of the reason, you know, guys are going with these lighter recoiling cartridges is yeah. so you can see you can see your hits or your misses, so you can adjust. And that's exactly it. So, But it does become a pain. So the drawback to these field format matches is there's more than a few stages where the targets are interspersed among really dense brush. Mm -hmm. You can't, I mean, you could shoot a cannonball and miss and not see where it went so pluses and minuses okay. um joe thank you and i really appreciate you coming on to most of the premieres and the live streams really appreciate it um uh, okay and this is actually a great question at what point does accuracy and non-existent recoil get trumped by barrel life and is barrel life even an issue at those points the trend I've seen as newbie is from four to five thousand rounds for a 308 and about thousands for a six millimeter. Oh, so there's a, there's a couple of things to unpack there. Yeah. Uh, so, I'll, 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 let me hand um, let me handle this part of it. Uh, about a thousand rounds for the six millimeters. It depends which six millimeters. Um, so six Creedmoor, possibly six millimeter arc, not as much. Um, go ahead. Yeah, I mean. Uh... I guess it comes down to basically like, you know, how important is it to you and, you know, how much how much money do you want to spend? You're absolutely right. I mean, you know, if if there's a cartridge out there that's going to, you know, you know, burn out your barrel, uh, you know, before you complete a couple matches and that's you got to be pretty committed to the project. Um, there are guys, I mean, obviously between between practice, load development, shooting 200 rounds in a match, some guys go through, you know, multiple a barrels. Barrel match. Yeah, barrel of match or multiple barrels a season at the very least. So, so it's a very good point. I mean, on the flip side of the coin, some of the match, at least the matches we should, I can't speak for all of them. There's actually a separate division for for three oh eight and even two two three. So, if you want to shoot three oh eight, you'll be going against other guys that are shooting three oh eight as far as scoring, and you can do that. So you're not really at a disadvantage. And yeah, you're going to get obviously a lot more barrel life, you know, out of something like a 308 than you are a six millimeter Creed more that's hot loaded. And I would say, you know what, like, I think that's really going to be hit at a point of 
is barrel life even going to be an issue for you? Because if your main goal is in what you're, if you, most of your shooting is competition type shooting, your barrel life is generally not going to be an issue that you even think about because what you're thinking about is, Hey, I need to be able to pull the trigger and maintain that perfect sight picture. And I need a caliber that's going to impact with enough momentum that I can still see the splash if I miss. And so it still needs to carry the energy and I want it to be pleasant shooting. Those are going to be your priorities versus, Hey, do I have three or 400 bucks for an extra barrel? Um, because like I said, if, I mean, how much is a general match fee? 300 bucks usually? Yeah. yeah you know, upper twos, lower threes. Yeah. So it's like at that point, like you just kind of consider, and I know it's like, it must be shocking for like somebody who's new. Um, but when you compete, if you're competing at those higher levels and you know, you need those type of barrel burner cartridges, you break the, down the cost of that barrel over the life of the matches. So let's say, for example, if you're not crazy and let's say you get three or four matches per barrel. So let's say a barrel is going to be, unless you're going carbon fiber, let's say your barrel is going to be 400 bucks tops. You're basically breaking down a hundred dollars per barrel, and that's actually my camera. So I, Matt, you address that while I go change the battery. <laughs> you know, I was actually almost going to have to do the same thing, but I'm glad it wasn't me first. So, uh, no, you're exactly right. I mean, uh, you know, for instance, like this year, I'm going to shoot three or four matches with uh, the six Creedmoor, and uh, three or four matches with the six five Creedmoor, and yeah, in general, between the practice rounds, the, the match round count, you know, I'll probably consider the the six millimeter Creedmoor barrel basically toast. And you will know, plan on, you know, basically swapping out that barrel out of the, out of the Ruger Precision Rifle. Um, it's just now I think it all I mean, it's you know, it all starts to depend on on uh, obviously your accuracy level and whether or not it gets throated enough that it starts affecting your, you know, SDs or ESs. I actually, I don't hundred percent know that it does, but I've, I've heard guys talk about the throat gets worn out. Then you start seeing some erratic numbers and the barrel starts speeding up again and slowing down again. So, but, but realistically, I mean, I think I'll get the three or four matches out of the six Creedmoor this year, but then, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to go into a second season planning on shooting another 1200 to 1500 rounds out of that particular barrel. Um, or the six, five, the, the, the six, five barrels actually already a little bit, a little bit long in the two. Um, and started to notice the accuracy open up a little bit, but it's still shooting well enough that, that I'm going to go ahead and run it. I was saying, I think that's going to be a great point too. It's going to be, well, it's not like that the barrel is going to shoot sub half MOA and then all of a sudden it just shoots two MOA. Right. It's going to be progressive. The group start opening up. And I know what some of the people will do is they will get the barrel reboard just a little bit, bored a little bit deeper. So then you have no more throat erosion. Um, but it's really going to come down to, I think barrel, the cost of a barrel replacement spread over the number of matches is going to be just a small, one of the smaller expenses versus the match fees that you're paying, the ammo that you're going to be shooting, the travel budget that you're going to have, it's going to be one of the lower cost centers from that perspective. Yeah. And then, I mean, and it might not be bad. It might not be good enough for matches, but it's still going to be good enough for you to go plinking steel targets where you only need one MOA accuracy. Sure. Well, you can also, obviously you can also, you know, rechain, you know, basically, uh, you know, start taking off the, off the chamber and rechambering it, you know, re, you know, you can do that. Um, you know, so you have a stub of a barrel, but, uh, no, but it's, but it's a good point. I mean, for instance, the the six the the one of the six fives that we have in uh, for Catalyst. I mean, it's actually been kind of a go to gun. It's part of why I keep using it. It was they've all been very accurate, but this one was just you know one of those ones that everybody did everything right that day. Maybe the chamber reamer was really sharp <laughs> that day, or brand new, whatever else. It always has just shot really well. And so it's been kind of a go-to gun, but I have noticed that it started to open up a little bit, but at the end of the day, a quarter MOA gun, if it turns into a half MOA gun, or frankly, even a three quarter MOA gun, 
as long as it's consistent, it's still it's still very adequate for these kinds of matches. Most, at least, again, you know, a lot of these matches are shooting steel targets. They're not they're not judging your group size. I mean, yep. so it's not it's not it's not an F class match where you know if you're you know if you're basically shooting outside of one hole, you're not in the game. Um, you just got to hit the target. And frankly, a three quarter MOA rifle, as long as it does it very consistently, is Plenty, plenty adequate. I mean, that's great. I mean, if you've got a rifle that shoots like that, man, go shoot it. Go have fun. So, Awesome. So I think that's going to answer the question fairly well. Um, it just depends on you. And I think it just, as long as you know about it and you can plan about it, that those two things, I don't, yes, they're related, but I don't think one has anything to do with the other if you're going to need it. Um, yeah, one more thing about, about, yeah, is so one of the trends that I've seen personally with, with some of the guys that I shoot with and also guys that I, that I know of shooting is they're, they're actually mitigating the six millimeter loads a little bit. So for instance, on the six millimeter GT, you know, guys aren't necessarily, uh, you know, hot rotting this thing with the Creedmoor, for instance, things originally was well we're going to take the you know the 108s or the 105s and you know try to run these up you know right at the right at the legal edge of 3200 feet per second and most guys have backed off for consistency they're you know 2900 ish there's even guys shooting some of the six millimeter loads at 2800 ish so i would suspect you're actually going to see your six millimeter barrel life actually go up a little bit yeah so anyway just wanted to point that out no, and, and yeah, definitely. So, I mean, the PRS rules is 3150, but on a lot of the forums, and like even in 31, what? I was just joking. I, I said 32, you know, if you're not kind of, anyway, sorry, I'm just kidding. Is it 3150 or 32? 32, 32. No, 32. You're, 32. You're, you're right. I'm just saying most guys would just kind of, you know, what was it? I'm oh, sorry. I didn't know that. <laughs> um, But no, it's like, even if you're doing low development, you'll notice that your best groups are not going to be at the top generally. We're going to be like one or two nodes down. Um, so it's going to depend. If you're going for maximum accuracy, you're probably going to come down off of that load a little bit as well. Yep. Cool. All right. I think we beat that question to a point. Um, all right, what the heck? My notice said you start at 8. So, Drew, generally, I do my video premieres at 8.30 p.m. Eastern time. But because with Matt's calendar, we had to do it at 7. And I'm fairly sure I did 7. All right. Uh, also from Drew, I have a Defex Squad Ace tripod. I love the unit. Carbon fiber, lightweight, can That's make nice. it into a bipod as well. Yeah. Lots of questions too. Uh, 1913 and Swiss Arca rail in one clamp. Oh, lots of options too. Yeah, yeah. Gonna have to look Familiar? at that. Cool. Um, hmm. Drew, do you see it? He just held up the scope and wins. Yeah, so this month we're giving away an Element Titan scope, uh, but this is not the Element Titan. This is the Loophole Mark V HD. I have not convinced him to do a giveaway for one of those. Kind of, kind of like that one? Looks like it. <laughs> All right. I'm gathering intel and general census as to PRS to ELR F class, barrel cleaning frequency, carbon, copper, oiling. Any thoughts? Uh, well, I would say there's some people out there who just don't even clean their barrel. I, I mean, like, wait, 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 you clean these things? Um, <laughs> some of them shoot better when they're actually dirty. Yeah, I, but I'm not like, going to talk. To just don't say that to the bench trust people because they they clean after every shot for consistency, of course. Yeah, well, well, and that's that's actually a very valid point. So I think it, you know, again, kind of comes. Yeah, it comes down to your rifle. I mean, I. You know, I, I obviously kind of once, uh, I mean, once I start, you know, for each match, you know, you start practicing, um, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to go out and do a whole bunch of practice clean, you know, common sense, right. Clean the gun and then put it away. I mean, you know, whatever the last, the last practice session was, which will, you know, consist of obviously confirming a zero or confirming an impact point for Ford off, uh, you know, then it's not going to get clean till you know after that match. And frankly, if that, I've you know gone a match or two without cleaning. I'm kind of embarrassed to say, but it is what it is. Get more guns. Yeah, and just don't clean them. There get you go. Get the gun. Um. All right. So 
I've heard past a thousand yards, it's harder because time of flight and in relation from the Earth's rotation. So that's the Coriolis effect. Matt, go ahead. Uh, great in theory, not in practice. Yeah. So you can basically, uh, most of the ballistics calculators, just plug it in. It's going to take into account for all of those things. So it's, um, I would say the, the toughest part about ELR type shooting is when you pull the trigger and then you're waiting you're waiting for the bullet and you're like, oh, there it is. And then you see it impact. So well, and it, and what really, that does is you, you start to actually not follow through as well because you get impatient because you want to look up because you know that you can. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I mean, I, I'm joking, of course, to say that if your cartridge is slow enough, you got to worry about the Coriolis effect. You need a new cartridge. But <laughs> uh, but in either case, most of the ballistics calculators, such as if you're using a even the free ones, like the Hornady Ford off, it's going to take care of all those calculations for you. All right. I would say to kind of go back to it, what's going to have a bigger impact is actually the bull, the natural, whether you have right or left hand twist in your barrels, that's going to have more of an impact in Coriolis at those low ranges. Um, all right. I'm personally starting out at the bottom, just learn all the pains of growing, learning curves, etc. Sure, I could just dig out one of the $3,500 rifles, but that wouldn't be any fun. No. This way you get to shoot a lot more stuff. You're absolutely right. Yeah. Well, I guess, I guess kind of the question is, like, do you want to be one of those guys who you go out to the range with a big, expensive rifle, and then you can't shoot it? Actually, and it was funny, because, like, I mean, I went out to a range, and there's a guy I was, like, filming with one of the cheap Rugers, I think, Actually, it was one of the six arc guns, possibly. And it was a cheaper gun. And there's somebody there who had uh, Accuracy International, like, full package with a Heinzold. Yes, I think I pronounced it correct. Wow. With a scope. Yeah. So it's basically like a $15,000 package yeah. between the gun and that. And that's what he paid. And then he asked me, hey, can you help me zero this? And, like, he couldn't shoot it better than, like, one, one and a half MOA. So get a cheap gun until, I said, you know what it is? It's like, if you buy an expensive gun and your groups suck, it's very easy for people to blame the gun. Whereas it's probably generally the shooter. So I would say is get a fact, that's why you get a factory gun that you learn on until you get to the point in time where you know whether it's you as the shooter or the and you know at what point the gun is actually holding you back and how i'd say that's or like when you're able to pull the trigger and you immediately know without looking at the target you immediately know and you're able to call your shot like yep i pulled that shot or this or that um you start cheap and like i said even same thing like one of the popular questions okay well should i start with a 6.5 creed more or a 308 Ten years ago, the advice was get a Remington 700 police in 308. <laughs> now it's like get a Ruger American in 65 Creed more, or basically any other 65 Creed more because it's going to shoot. But because the caliber is inherently more accurate out of the box and less sensitive to ammo, I think it's almost a little bit tougher. That I would say go get a 308. It's going to be more fun. You're going to suck with it a little bit more. And wind is going to have a bigger impact. Um, the bullet drop is going to have a bigger impact than it has on 6.5 Creedmoor. So, yeah, you can take a 6.5 Creedmoor, and if you're out west, you can go take a Ruger American and go shoot a mile. You're not going to do that with a 308. Uh, once you go past seven, 800 yards out west, or if you're out east past 600 yards, 308 is just starts dropping like a rock. Um, you're going to learn a lot about that. And if you learn a three weight, then you go to almost any other, let's say six creed more. Uh, this is going to be like, wow, this is like cheating. <laughs> yeah. Oh, without a doubt. That's exactly right. Uh, all right. So, okay. I'm going to go that route and use a cheaper gun to get my needs sorted out and skill enough to outshoot it. There you go. Uh, so this is actually when we're, I guess we were discussing that. I want to learn <laughs> shooting style Winchester model 70. Nice. Well, John, I have a I have a left hand Model seventy uh, clock extractor, you know Winchester Model seventy, and love that gun. So I don't I don't blame you. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, anyone know if Peterson Brass will ever or soon offer PRC Brass? I'm fairly positive they do. That's for 6.5 PRC. Um, I tried to type it in chat, but the other one is ADG. So you have Lapwav, which announced that they're going to um, make Brass for, I believe it was 6.5 or 300 PRC, but at least one of those two. You have ADG, which has Brass and then Hornady. And I believe Peterson already has some. All right. Uh, I'm excited. To see, I'm I'm just excited. New stuff is cool. When I shoot five or six hundred yards, fifteen years ago, I had a Finn M39 or a Tight Mose 9130. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it, like I said, those fins are pretty dang accurate guns. All right. Uh, so John. Yep. I know Lapa, but I don't know if Peterson. All right. Um, The last scope I used was from the 50s. I'm excited for that Rona check so I can cross a dream gun off of my list. There you go. Use the stimulus. I think all of them can burn you. <laughs> all right. Uh... Oh, yeah. Why he's, huh? Okay, yeah, so we're talking about the brass. Uh, Matt, you got a new fan. Thank you, Matt Foster. You're welcome. I'm not sure I did, but you're welcome. <laughs> um, hello? Okay, here we go. I think this one's for you. Ah. Silly. Yeah. Um... I feel offended that you didn't ask me. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, uh, we did, I, think, no, I, probably, I probably go picked ahead. a few more apart. Slav. Um, you know, frankly, I, I mean, it's, you know, Pyrrhus will scoff. I mean, obviously, because, you know, I mean, anything with the center, the little, you know, center dude, Pierce are going to scoff at. Yeah, the dongle are going to scoff at. Um, I like it. I mean, it, it is adjustable. They're, you know, they're, hey, they're a big corporation. They had to, you know, cover their ass. Their lawyer's safe. You can only adjust it down so far. But, um, I mean, so, so I've got a Timney in the six millimeter and love that trigger. I mean, it feels really great. It's and no dog in the fight. It's just drop that in and it's a really, really nice setup. Um, but the Ruger trigger, I mean, it is not bad. I mean, it's, it's not going to hold you back. It's definitely not one you're going to sit there and think the safety is on by any means, you know, um, I think if you adjust it properly, you know, there's it. the dongle does one thing for you, which I mean, some people prefer a single stage, some prefer a two stage trigger. Mm -hmm. I've always kind of liked the two stage triggers. Yes. Um, I kind of like that, that, you know, that take up and then knowing that, okay, I am right where any further movement trips the sear. Yep. And that's what that dongle does for you. And sometimes when I'm shooting the Timney, which doesn't have that, sometimes I miss that. So, you know, a little bit of personal preference, but I mean, you know, I, you know, if, okay. if you, if you can afford it, try them both. Is the Timney a single stage or is it a two stage? You know, I got to check. I'm not sure. It might be. Two you know, so like, is there any take up on it at all? Well, I'd go, I'd go check, but you know, rules. Um, so. <laughs> okay. Um, so so that's, I, that's, I that's actually a very good question. I guess, go I guess I'll take, I'll take you off of here. Go check. <laughs> Oop, hold on other way other way go back um, so much like matt said so i also prefer a two-stage trigger so where you're going to be able to pull it in you come to a wall so you have take up you come to a wall and then the trigger breaks uh, a lot of the precision rifles shooters they're just single stage where there is absolutely no creep and then you just pull the trigger and it breaks um so it is personal preference i think for starting out the regular two stage, well, the regular two stage trigger in the Ruger Precision Rifle is actually quite good because you can use, as Matt said, pulling in the dongle. I consider it stage one, and then so basically you know to be ready and to pull it. Um, the other reason, kind of like why I like it, is you can, as long as you remind yourself that you're pulling in the dongle. It's kind of like a reminder to pull it straight back as opposed to jerking it side to side. Um, and when we're shooting both the Hawkeye 
and the RPR back to back, that was actually one of the consideration points for a lot of people. Um, the, so the, the Ruger trigger is adjustable. I think it's fine. Uh, the only issue I have is when some of the bladed triggers, it's very almost like they kind of get jammed up. And one gun I'm thinking of is the Thompson Center LRR. There are other people who reported those issues. I haven't had that many of them. Where if you don't pull in the dongle in perfectly straight back, sometimes it binds a little bit side to side. And in some of them, it's very easy because you can just start pushing it in like to the, slightly to the side and just completely binds up on you. Um, I haven't had those issues with the Ruger. And then I just tested the Mossberg, which is the video is going to be out on Monday. God willing, as long as I finish editing it. Um, you'll see what I'm talking about there. And that one also has a bladed trigger, but that was actually a really nice bladed trigger. I didn't have any issues with it. But along the same line, so we have the, I did the intro video to the Ruger custom shotgun. And um, I have the entire video completed, but that gun is still under embargo. But the video is ready for whenever Ruger decides to announce it. And so that one has the new trigger tech trigger, which is a two stage trigger. And there's a little bit of take up, which is awesome. And then there's a very nice clean trigger break. So that's a two stage. Um, there's also a Timney trigger, which I should be getting almost any day. So um, Aaron from Aaron from Anarchy Outdoors hooked us up um, and he wanted to see because he can't get his hands on that trigger, but he wants to see a comparison of it. And I do have a Timney trigger, uh, but it it was the generation one, and I think someone slightly fucked it fucks fucked with it. Um, so I don't want to use that as the official comparison. And I had it; a, it was given to me used, so that's why. Uh, but I'm getting a new Timney trigger to compare to that, and then I'm hoping from Jard, I'm going to get their single stage trigger for the RPR, and we're going to have a video comparing all three triggers. Um, and that one, as soon as I get the two other triggers, um, we will do a comparison video. And as soon as I can, I will, we'll take him out to the range. We'll have them all in one gun. So, and we'll see what type of an impact that it has on the group. So that comparison is coming. Did you hear that, Matt? I did. So, so you're a anarchy outdoors. Thank you again. Uh, they're hooking us up with the Timney, so we're going to compare with the trigger tech. And what did you find on your Timney? Single stage? No, it's, it's a two stage. Two so stage. It's okay. just, you know, obviously just it's very light and obviously feels different than the uh, Ruger trigger with the dongle. So, um, I mean, at the end of the day, I would prefer to have the Timney for, a comp for my competition gun. So, uh, but but that being said, I mean, the Ruger trigger is not a bad trigger. I mean, like I said, purists will scoff at a dongle regardless of how good it is, but it's it's not bad. Yeah, and like I said, and often oftentimes most of those triggers can be adjusted down to the same weight. Um, it's just going to be how clean or what type of a trigger blade you have, or how clean of a pull. Sorry, how clean of a pull you're going to have. Um, the expe uh, exception is there are some triggers that you can get down to eight or ten ounces. Um, so that's yeah. light. What, what, what do you have your trigger set for for PRS? I have not. I just did it by feel. I don't. I didn't put a trigger pull. Yeah. So the, uh, the the Ruger the Ruger trigger does have one nice feature, which is it's adjustable in the gun. Yeah. So you don't need to take now it out. that being said, you have if you're using our magazine release extension, you have to remove that to adjust the trigger. That's why that hole is actually in the magazine release. The little Allen wrench goes through the magazine release into recess in the trigger, and you can adjust it. Oh, by the way, I'm still waiting for one. What? Yeah. yeah. If only you knew somebody. I know. I'm missing one. FYI. What color do you want? Black? Gray? Oh, wait. Maybe red. I don't know. That's a stupid question, Matt. <laughs> All right. So here's actually a good question compared to that. Um, and yes, I'll take one in Slavic red, please. Um, I got a good question. I just I just fought up. As a bigger guy, say 300 pounds, 6'2", how much of the market in customizations are designed for bigger shooters over the average size person? That's part one. And part two is I've got 36 inch arms from armpit to fingertip. 
is why even fixed stock AR-15s are too short. So I would say I have the opposite problem. So I have 32 inch uh, sleeves that I usually wear. So go ahead. That's actually a really good question. Yeah, I mean, you know, unfortunately, uh, and keep in mind, so, so I'm a left-handed shooter, so I know all about, you know, lack of customization. Um, Sorry, did you say you're wrong-handed? Yeah, See, I can say that on a live stream. I get roasted for that. Yeah, I, I just have an issue. So, like, I don't know, in my family, my wife is left-handed. One of my daughters is. We joke about it all the time, and, like, it, it's a joke, and, like, no one gets offended. I put out one video where I say wrong-handed one time, I get like, I think every single left-handed person in the world comes out to like ridicule for that. Meanwhile, zero people had an issue with me calling people FUDs, but I digress. I'm going to get off my soapbox now. No, no, no. I, so, so I get it. Um, you know, that's, that actually is a good question. I mean, so, so I used to work at Marlin, you know, uh, you know, back when, you know, donkeys were still, you know, turning the boom to power the machines. And honestly, yeah, I would say anything over sort of like average size range really probably didn't come up. I mean, you know, to a little bit probably shame, you know, shame on us and the gun manufacturers to a certain extent, but, you know, kind of really didn't, you know, more worried about is it going to be too big for smaller statured shooters? I mean, very, very rarely, I guess, did the conversation ever go the other way. Well, what about somebody who, you know, might have longer arms than T-Rex? You know, I don't know. So, uh you probably you've probably gotten really good at like adding spacers to your butt plates and and everything else. And I think this is based. So I would recommend actually, um, and if you have an RPR, so I for me it was the RPR, an the RPR has a lot of adjustment. Okay, so the RPR stock has a lot of length of pull adjustment. So one of the stocks that I like is the. FAB wrap stock, the rapid adjustable precision stock, that has a good amount of length of pull adjustment. I put that stock on the RPR, and for me, even when folded in all the way, was too long because the RPR, because you're adding it on to the folding mechanism, so it adds like another inch over a standard rifle. So, um, Joe, you actually might want to look into that. So, if you want a bolt gun, the FAB wrap stock combined with that, because especially since the wrap stock also has more adjustment in it, would be actually quite good. Um, that would actually help you. And just even in general, the FAB wrap stock is going to be good. Cool. Um, I'm skipping ahead. We'll come back. So I already knew you would give your professional opinion upon RPR trigger. Yes, yes, yes. But it's not professional opinion. It's just my own thing. Although I guess it isn't. Forty-five gap is an awesome caliber, and not we're gonna this. make it great again. Not this again. <laughs> uh, okay, so that was my problem. Seven sixty by fifty-four. After about five hundred yards, it really starts dropping. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, heavier bullet. In the great case, cartridge, great, great cartridge, though. Yeah. All right. Uh, I'm skipping all over. Uh, barrel cleaning is a very polarized group of people. Clean every 100, 200, 300. Some don't clean at all. Um, yeah. Well, I guess the, the bigger one is actually going to be for barrel break-in. That's also going to be related to that because you have some people who are like, okay, you got to clean it then you clean it after every round for the first couple of rounds yeah and then you have others who basically say just just go shoot it um i don't think there's i think cleaning it is you'll know when you need to clean it um once you start feel getting a feel for your gun if things starts looking wacky i.e the group starts shifting or something give it a clean see how it does um the one exception would be basically if you're sh for pistols, if you're shooting lead bullets, you clean the freaking thing or um, you're shooting surplus ammo. I don't care what kind of surplus ammo, or what kind of caliber. A lot of that stuff is corrosive. You clean it after every time you go shoot because uh, otherwise you might you're going to come back and you're going to find that your gun is uh, um, rusted. Yeah, glowing, glow, uh, growing blue crystals. 
Thank you, for, John. Thank you. Uh, thank you for answering the questions. I plan to be more of a recreational shooter, and that's where the shooting is a lot of fun. <laughs> yes. So, uh, shooting gallery, New England. Joe, thank you for joining. He's a fellow content creator. Guys, go check out his channel. He is very committed to doing live streams, and he does one every week, basically. Huh? And we, he just got a new Ruger American, so his first bolt gun. It's. Yeah. All right, um, 15 I don't want to be that gun. All right, so this really kind of goes back to whether you're a shooter or a collector. Uh, I think there are a lot of people who they have the income and they just want to be able to have the best stuff, whether they need it or not. And I think kind of like even in the optics world, you'll have a lot of people that say, hey, go buy a loophole or hey, go buy a night force and just spend the money on it, whether or not you're going to be able to use it to its full potential. Um, I'd say even like when it comes to, let's say, I mean, you do get accuracy as you get higher in price. I'm not going to say reliability because when you're spending that much money on them, the tolerances are so thin. So just go take a little bit of dust and sprinkle it. It's just get all going to seize. <laughs> Uh, but it is going to be nicer in a lot of the features. Um, but I think it's like, it's going to be diminishing returns. I mean, once you spend more than, once you have a good barrel, everything else is diminishing returns in terms of accuracy. Um, and, but unless you're a collector and those people just want to do it, but Hey, you know what? More power to anybody who wants to spend that much money. <laughs> Nothing wrong with the Taurus when it works. <laughs> my plan uh nice. carlos Hafgal can pick up a reproduction 8x power so, okay uh okay so now i think we caught up okay so scope question yay would you recommend an element titan or a vortex strike eagle to go on a prs type rifle what have anything to add or do you want me to answer that one? Uh, Question go ahead and answer that one. So, let me say, what did you say, Matt? I said, go ahead and answer that one. Um, so that's, it depends. Um, so what they have in common is they're both 34 millimeter tubes. They are both 5 to 25. And then there are going to be a bunch of differences. Um, so we're going to have roughly the... The Strike Eagle is going to have slightly more internal elevation adjustment, but for PRS, it's not even going to make a difference. I mean, you're talking about like two mils difference. They're both going to get you at least 28, which is going to be enough to get you out with most calibers out past way past the mile anyway. So that's not going to be a difference. I mean, one of the big differences is going to be the weight. Um, oh, so one similarity is they are both made in China. Uh, one is made by Vortex, one is made by Element. Uh, the Titan is going to be heavier, quite a bit heavier. So the Strike Eagle, I believe, is 30 ounces wow. or 32. The Titan is 38 or 39. Um, image quality, I like the turrets a lot better on the Titan. I like the Zero Stop better on the Titan. The Strike Eagle is going to have a locking turret caps. Uh, you're not going to have that on the Titan. Uh, but I feel you have a lot nicer turrets on the Titan than the Strike Eagle. Uh, so for me, the Strike Eagle was just a little bit mushy. Um, image quality wise, so I mean, I, I actually have the Titan right now on the Mossberg gun. Um, I took it out to the range. It was so we were shooting in cl dark, cloudy, overcast with snow on the ground. And so basically crappy shooting conditions. Um, and the Titan did really well. I was going to say not, I would say 95% as close to it as the Leupold Mark V HD. So I think the Titan is a very good scope. And if I was spending my own money, there is going to be a little bit of a price difference. So they both have the same MSRP, uh, but usually you can get the Strike Eagle for about $6.99. The Titan is going to be, I believe, $7.99. Um, so at the same price, I would say absolute, I would go with the Titan. If there's more than $200 difference or if weight is an issue, um, I would say possibly go with a Strike Eagle. 
But if you want more weight for PRS, then I'll go with the Titan in that regard. Um, the only other point of consideration is Vortex is a much bigger company. Um, so if you have an issue, they have a big warranty budget. So they'll just make sure to replace it. You still have the same warranty on the element, but they are a newer company. Um, having said that, I haven't had issues with either scope. However, there's quite a few people who have issues with the Strike Eagle in terms of tracking. Um, I haven't had that on mine, but I also don't have a Strike Eagle anymore because it dropped and it, the eyepiece on it like really bent and cracked. So I just sent that demo unit back. Um, but yeah, so I'll probably lean towards the Titan. Um, just because I like the guys, they're hardcore shooters. I think the build quality is nicer and the turrets are nicer on the Titan. So, uh, Callum, hopefully that answers that question. And I have a video for both of those scopes. Um, so, and they're both, the Titan I did less than a month ago. So, just look at the recent videos, but I did both. Okay. Thank you, Drew. Uh, yeah, so actually, like I, said, I can't take credit for it. This was actually one of Matt's clients, which was Aaron, who's like, hey, since I can't get a trigger tech, can you do a video comparison? Um, so, and the only thing it is, I'm going to add the jar trigger. And so this is going to be the three commercially available Ruger precision rifle triggers. All right. Yeah, so USPS is like really stupid behind, and I'm sure you're impacted by that too. You have a lot of pissed off people who order. Oh my gosh. Yeah, it's been kind of unfortunate. So this is going back to the long uh, armed people. <laughs> don't, don't, don't feel selfish. I mean, I get it. Well, look at this way. If you're looking about shotguns, once you go past like a thousand bucks or so, a lot of those shot, I mean, there's huge business where the shotgun stock is tailored just for you. I mean, I don't think we have that specifically in the rifle world, but in the shotgun world, that is the norm. Uh, doesn't matter what your height is. The norm is that you're going to, the norm is that uh, you're going to get a custom for you anyway. And I would say contact, if you really want a nice stock, contact someone like Manners or another stock builder and they'll customize it for you or at least get something that has additional spacers. So like the Ruger Hawkeye long range target, you can put additional spacers on that. Yeah, and by all means, I mean, take the time to make the gun fit you. Don't fit yourself to the gun. I mean, getting the gun to fit you properly is a lot of what contributes to consistency, which equals accuracy. I mean, so man, do it. do what you got to do. I mean, three gun shooters like, hey, nice gun. Where's my Dremel tool? So, you know, just, yeah, make it your own. So I'm not even going to entertain this trash of a comment. <laughs> uh, to be fair, if the single stack mags held on longer, the gap. So actually, gap is a double stack mag. The whole entire premise of gap is that you in the Glock, which is the only place where it's really an issue, they wanted a 45 in a small frame Glock platform because the 45 ACP was too wide. Um, it, no, really what led to the downfall was when they launched the caliber, they did not have 230 grain projectile loads. Uh, for hand loaders, we're always able to do that. But when Gap was SAMI spec, it was SAMI spec with a 185. So people were saying, well, if I'm going to get a 45, just get a... If I want a 45, I'm going to get the 230 grain variant. And it will, if I want a lighter weight bullet, then I'll just go with the 40. Um, so that's why you got to got problems. But it's a very pleasant caliber to shoot. Well, Hello, you ask, have, you, have you done a video on the 45 gap yet? No, I have not. I mean, maybe you should because. I definitely have to ask Glock for a couple of guns. My, <laughs> my 45 gaps are in Springfield. Mm, okay. Actually, but that'll be for a segment of my first handgun because that was my first handgun. Not wow. the first handgun I bought, but the first handgun. And you know what? You can go to the stores and find 45 gap ammo for reasonable prices. So there. <laughs> well, there you go. Everybody do not enter the giveaway for the scope because I'm going to win it. 
Drew, I, I, if I could pick, I, I would, but it's random. <laughs> and there's so actually, I gotta say, so we've had for that scope. I don't know what it is. Um, we've had over fourteen hundred people already in like four days enter that giveaway for the Element Titan. I'm sorry, Element, the new Helix. Uh, awesome. Thanks for the heaps of information. Definitely helps with the decision coming from someone. Awesome. Very, very cool. Wow. Hmm. All right. So I think wrapping up with the comments. Yes. I love 1911. So I think a 1911 is the bestest handgun design in the world. I do. I love 1911s. Well, there you go. So I'm, I'm a shitty Slav, but like I like 1911s. I think it's the bestest caliber in the world. And I actually prefer the AR platform to the AK platform, but we're not going to talk about that. Oh, you want to hear about something that's really completely mind-blowing? So in the U.S. right now, you have a whole bunch of people who are like in love with the AK platform, and they want like American-made AKs and all that. Do you know what the new hotness in Russia is right now in the shooting sports? ARs. ARs. It's like everyone wants an AR because AKs are for the poors. And like if you're cool, you get an AR. And there's actually a bunch of Russian companies now who are making domestic ARs. That's funny. Well, it has a lot better ergonomics. Um, the intrinsic benefit of an AR is the solid receiver top and mounting optics, period. I'm sorry. Yes. So well, you have... Squishy receiver that, coverage. Squishy receiver coverage it doesn't cut it. With the AK-12, I mean, they did fix that issue. Um, but yeah. All right. So I think we, we went for the questions, and I've held you on long enough. Holy crap, we went for two hours. Uh, all right. So it's time to draw the winner. And by the way, so if you're joining, this is going to be on replay. And then we did have a more formalized segment that I'm going to release that as a video a little bit later. All right, so Matt, you can address those questions. I am going to pull up a. So I'm looking at my laptop. I'm launching the giveaway. Okay. And we're going to announce the winner. But the problem is, so like, it, if I show the screen, it's going to show public information, well, private information for the winner. So that's why I'm just going to do this, and then I will announce the first name and initial. But as we had 1,450 people enter the giveaway. Nice. And so we're going to winners. All right, so we are going to, we're going to delete the invalid actions. Some people tried to cheat. Okay, and we're gonna pick. We're gonna pick. How's that? Multiple entries. Yeah, we did something. Okay. All right, we're gonna draw one winner, and so at any time. Two, two, two. And the winner of the Chote stock, and so the winner of the Chote stock and the Fix It Stick kit is Eric Stevenson. I'm not gonna release his name. Um, out of Philadelphia. Excellent. Congratulations, Eric. And want to hear something? He only, okay, no, 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 he had like a couple of entries. I'm like, he just picks just one. So there you go. So Eric, uh, you will get an email and, uh, you have a couple of days to claim it. <laughs> so okay. just reply back. And then, uh, so either Matt, Matt, are you going to take care of that or should we send it to? Well, I get you'll take care of the choke one. So Matt is going to help you out and he'll make sure that you get both. So yes. There we go. So we have our winner for the giveaway. Yay. Very good. Excellent. And then it'll be, inter it'll be interesting to see what Guinea wants a stock for, whether it's a Remington or a Savage or Yes. And we're not going to force you into that. So that's actually one of the questions that popped up is like, hey, should we send you the stock? And then you send it away. I'm like, eh. How about we just kind of do it as a certificate for a stock, and then you'll yes. pick for whatever platform you have it. So, which one does Choke make it for? So, we have Remington Howa. Which yeah, is Rem Rem have. yeah, so Remington Footprint, long and short action, BDL, detachable mag, um, 
all the various flavors of the savage uh the only ones i looked at mostly um they do make a winchester so they make a number of a number of stuff i mean a lot of the different guns so cool yeah so you look for the website might be a little difficult but just let them know matt's gonna hook you up and that's gonna be that giveaway so maybe in a couple of months we'll do another sure yes we, we lined up Matt for another one. So well, we had a awesome. lot of questions, a lot of input. It was really good. Very good. And hopefully, I'm going to kind of say that again. I hope that uh, Choate makes us th- it makes them inlet for the Ruger Americans. Just saying. Yes. <laughs> or, Wait, or, do you, do you or, want to do you want to announce some shows? Uh, let's just say we're we're working on the the American is a is a you know twinkle. Um, there there may or may not be an, an Axis you know stock in okay. the uh, very near future. So, but the Axis is not not as nice as the Ruger American. Although I guess is it close enough to the one ten? And it, Derek, if Derek is here, he can probably answer that because he's a big sound guy. But you know, there's a, there's a lot of those out there. Makes Remember, sense. And injection molding is a volume game. So. Well, here, well, how, so how do we actually make, I mean, like, what's the difference with the, I mean, is it, well, is the mold the same? And then it's just the difference of the aluminum beds or how? It depends, depends on the gun, but yeah. So, so the same mold will manufacture multiple, you know, multiple products depending upon, you know, the length of the aluminum chassis and so forth. So a lot of work goes in that CNC chassis that then gets dropped into the mold. Yeah. And I say, so the more I play with this stock, it's like it's really nice and it's like you feel the weight with it um so obviously you guys can see it so it's a it's a polymer stock but it has full length aluminum throughout it that adds a good amount of weight um so well, and, looking- and, and and rigidity the thing about the thing about what a lot of guys don't like about you know factory synthetic stocks is basically you know when you when the barrel when you look at the barrel i mean you basically can just put pressure on the fore end and it just flexes up to the barrel i mean they're just squishy and it's interesting. People try to like fill. Uh, so I'm trying to get my right there's the camera. So people try to fill, you know, this part of the stock with epoxy, thinking that's mm-hmm. going to stiffen it up. Where the stock is actually flexing is actually along this area here by the action. So it doesn't really do anything for you filling this four end channel with yeah. epoxy. It's this full length aluminum bed, you know, basically giving it rigidity that keeps the stock from flexing, you know, from flexing up with upward pressure. So it's, it's a nice setup. It does add some weight, but you know, you don't get something for nothing. So. Yeah. And I say like, if you are shooting, if you're going to be shooting the gun from a bench or prone most of the time and not moving it, I'd say weight is your friend. Oh, yeah. um, the more weight you have, it's less recoil um, and you'll be able to spot your own miss. So it's kind of like, the first time I shot that Ruger precision rifle, the custom shop, between the weight and the effective break, I pulled the trigger. And I'm like, wait, holy crap, it's still on the target. I can actually see it still at 100 yards. I'm like, wow, it's like, it's like, it's nice. Uh, versus if you're shooting a lot of large magnums or like I shot the lightweight hunting gun. So it's the 6.5 PRC Mossberg, it's a six pound gun total, six and a half. Wow. Without a muzzle break. Yeah. You pull the trigger, I'm like, holy crap. It's like you feel it in your shoulder, but also shooting it off of a bipod, the thing just like completely lodges off that I couldn't see where the miss was. Um, and like I said, adding like a heavier stock like this, which is what's actually nice is like I said, this is adjustable. Yeah, you, adjustable got the, you, got, you, got, you got the fancy one. I got the fancy one. So it's cool. Like I said, if it had Swiss Arca here, that would be awesome. We're working on it. Just you might get one in the near future. Just you know. Okay. Relax. Yay! Oh, oh. So we completely before we wrap up, we completely just didn't forgot to discuss. Did you see the Savage release? The new Savage release, the straight pull. I did. Did you play with it? Wait, do you have one to play with? I do not have one. So one interest. So so apparently, I mean, and I'm speaking purely from what I've seen online in yeah. pictures and so forth. Oh, sorry. Let me interject. So one of the th- Matt does a lot of stuff, and one of the things he does is he writes for magazines too. So he is media as well. That's why I asked him if he has one. No, so I did not. I did not see one yet. Uh, my, oh, uh, my sorry, sorry. I were one more, one more, one more. 
Exactly. And no, I do not currently have one. Um, I'm Mr. Ruger Guns. I'm not Mr. Savage Guns. <laughs> <laughs> but it's interesting. I'm looking forward to seeing it. I mean, I, I'm a, and again, no dog in the fight. I'm a Savage fan just from the standpoint that they've always made a, you know, very accurate gun at a very reasonable price. I'm very anxious to see this. That system, if, if you know, for laughs and giggles, Google Heim, H-E-Y-M, S-R-30. So it, it looks like it looks very similar. So I think they've taken some elements from that. They're claiming there's a number of patents involved. Okay. So I'm sure, I'm sure they just didn't copy it. But it is interesting. The ball bearing locking system for that straight pull looks intriguing. I hunted years ago with the Blazer 93 is their straight pull, I think. Um, on a caribou hunt, straight pull is kind of fun. But uh, so it'll, it'll be interesting to see what happens. Um, so Derek... Uh, Northwest gun reviewers, he just commented, I'm Mr. Savage Guns. And Derek, if you want to pop on, I sent you that link. So pop on, we'll have you in the convo as well. Um, and because it's it. So Derek, so Northwest gun reviewers, he is Mr. Savage Guns. Uh, hmm. although, he, although he doesn't get guns sent to him, he actually buys a lot of them. Um, so my question was like, so I saw that. So I mean, my experience with straight pulls is from the Schmiff Rubens, oh, yeah. uh, the, Swiss, the Swiss guns. And there were issues there. Uh, you had to reset full length size all of them all the time um, because the actions were slightly a little bit on the weaker side. So when I saw the ball bearing lock, so I haven't done too much research on it yet on the Savage one, but when I saw ball bearings, I'm like, I would have a fear that one of those ball bearings is going to fly out or like, oh, or, how much lo- or how much lockup is actually there. It's actually incredibly strong. Okay. Very, very strong. No, there's that action will be bulletproof. Okay. I mean, you're compressing, sorry, the, the geek and eat. So, so it's a lot of, I also occasionally design some gun parts. Um, yeah, there's you know, that, that too. I mean, the, the way the, the center part um, essentially pushes forward and then forces the ball bearings out, you essentially now have a compressive force. I'm not sure that's an engineering term, but if it's the right term, but you're you're not going to basically destroy all that with any any pressure coming backward. It's actually a very very strong action. The problem with the hey Derek, the problem with the Schmidt Rubin is it's not a problem. And I love the K31, but the problem is is that any of the straight poles that rely on some sort of helical sleeve and helical groove to rotate the bolt is you lose the leverage. So when you're working a bolt action, you have leverage to open the action. So if, you know, sticky cases or a sticky mm-hmm. bolt, yeah. you, you have leverage. The the straight pull, you're relying purely on a helical groove and a sleeve on the bolt, kind of like, well, kind of like an AR bolt carrier, really. And you you don't have that, that power behind it. So that's the only downside is something like the K31. The, yeah. the new Savage Impulse, when you when you rack that bolt back, it's just withdrawing basically a center core or, or mandrel away from the ball bearings, and they're allowed to basically get out of the way so the bolt can come back. So it's it's you, you kind of lose that need for, for leverage. It's, it's, a, it's an interesting system. Hmm. And that's going to be interesting. So one of the things that Derek brought up, and I guess he's having some issues, he's popping in and out. Um, the only because what calibers did they only launch it in now? Like it didn't seem like there's a lot of calibers. Well, I'm sure it's like three more. <laughs> actually, I don't know. I don't think so. Actually, I think it was just. Yeah. Are you sure? I I mean, admittedly, I watched the video. I didn't look at what they were in a chamber, and I assume just the it looked like a long standard. action. That's what it was. So I think it was. Uh, okay. We'll see when Derek pops back on. He knows. Uh, but it looked like it was just like a, only a long action, like for hunting and hmm. stuff. Well, it wouldn't surprise me. I mean, you know, to a certain extent, I mean, it's it's not going to be, you know, it's not going to be a PRS or a target gun. Um, Why not? You know, well, it's, that's a good question. I mean, I guess, I guess partly from just... Or I guess, the question, like, and why hasn't somebody actually else done an, a straight pull action in the while? Well, I need to look at, so I'm not sure how long the Heim SR30 was, uh, when it was introduced, when it was in production. Okay. So there may have been some patent issues. Um, but again, like I say, I'm not I'm not sure how much of this looks like the Heim 30 because Savage is claiming some patent pendings on it. So I, I don't know, so I can't speak to that. 
Uh, but it, but if you Google Hein 30, it does look very, very similar. It's a very similar principle. Hmm. Um, and, and they had it patented for a long time. So that's, you know, probably partly why. Um, I, I don't know what it does as far as any of the typical factors that, you know, equate to accuracy in a bolt action as far as, you know, concentricity with the bore and everything else. I mean, to your point, yeah, there's probably no reason it actually couldn't be a PRS action. I mean, it's, it's obviously catered towards the people that want speed because it looked like their, their promotional video uh, showed them, um, is it FTW, Slav, FTW Ranch, uh, doing the big game simulator where you got like the charging Cape Buffalo. So the, yes, the speed of that's FTW on, Ranch. Yeah, so, so the speed of getting shots on target was an issue uh, where even, you know, fractions of a second count between obviously like, you know, not getting stomped. Um, so they may be really only appealing to the people where that's an issue. I mean, I'm not sure like, you know, super quick follow-up shots are necessarily on, you know, deer necessarily. So I don't yeah. know, just spec a little speculation. Okay. So it looks like Derek is back and he should be good. But before that, so Sean, Sean asks, sorry if I missed it already. What about six millimeter arc? I love it. Well, I guess what's the, what, what's the question about it specifically, but I love the caliber type in the comments. We're here. All right. So, uh, oops. There we go. Hello, sir. How's it going tonight? All right. So you're the one. You're the savage fanboy. Uh, <laughs> what calibers is that new? Was Synergy in, or what are we calling it? Oh, they're doing it in 300 Win Mag. Is going to be the only Magnum caliber they're offering right now. They're doing the 30 odd six. I believe a 270, a 65 Creedmoor, and a 308. Okay. Um, honestly, I'm kind of shocked they didn't bring. They're not going to do it in a 7mm or the 280 actually improved. Why? And I'm, because, I'm East Coast. <laughs> well, because because the 7mm is a great hunting caliper um, okay. in the, for the Magnum cartridge. It's not as high pressure as a 300 win, in my opinion. And then the 280 actually improved is pretty much an improved version of a 30 odd 6, but okay. with a modified shoulder. Um, and it's not as high pressure as a 300 win. And that was their biggest worry from what I've been reading and hearing about um, with this new lockup system is having it, that and being an aluminum receiver and, uh -huh. and everything else. So they're so worried about pressure, but why are you offering in a 300 win and not something more capable of like a 280 AI, but there's or 300 PRC, you know, it's 300 win mag, just slap on a new barrel on there and that would be easy. See, that's the only question I haven't gotten answered. If this is going to be a standard Savage barrel thread system on this, or if it's going to be um, a different proprietary system. So no one's no one's releasing that information yet. The short video I saw it looked proprietary because I think the way the way that lockup system works, the that bolt has to actually go go down into the barrel. The locking lo the where it locks up is not with the receiver, at least from what I could see. Mm hmm. So I'm still, I don't know. I'm kind of hesitant about trying this now, honestly. Um, I want to, but it's one of those, do I want to try this in a, like a less pressure caliper to see how it works? Or do I want to jump to that 300 wind mag and go all out? So well, I doubt it's going to blow up on you. They wouldn't release it. It was going to go 300 win. Right. Go all in. So, so what I actually wondering, why not go like basically, I mean, a straight pull action, so I'm thinking kind of like the Olympic style shooting, would be very conducive to that because a lot of those, like you have the flicky action, do something like that for like 6.5 Grendel, 6 Arc, 7.62 by 39 in a mini size type action. That 6 5 PRC was another one I'm surprised that they're not going to launch it in. That is interesting. That is interesting. Well, I guess 6.5 PRC is, well, how does it feed? Is it AICS mags or what's, the, how does it feed? Yeah, it's AICS mags. So, I mean, it, cause it looked like it was one big long action, unless we have two different, act, I'll, I'll email my savage people and try to ask. Cause they got uh, three different models of it. They got the one that you're seeing with the, uh, the camo stock. And then they got a hunter, um, uh, like a hog hunter model. And then they got a predator model. So the one that they're only offering the one in the 300 wind mag, and that's the long range hunting one. So I guess 
Time will have to tell to see what happens with this, see if it gains popularity and see if it gains calipers, to be honest with you. I'm thinking it's going to be an epic failure, but that's just me. I think it's going to be the 45 gap of the world. <laughs> I don't know um, what to say. It's going to be interesting. Um, let's say, I, I would be interested, let's say, if it's a, in the short type action. Well, here's the thing. I mean, like, what else are you really gaining out of a straight pull action besides just slightly faster? Possibly. Well, I'll have to see what they say about it. Like I say, my understanding was that that design is actually very strong. Okay. Um, so, but but does it matter? I mean, at the end of the day, it's not like the actions they have now weren't holding the pressures of the cartridge. So, true. You know, you know keep it. I mean, keep in mind. I mean, when people ask about like what's the definitive advantage and all this other stuff, I mean, so you know, it's sort of you know weird tangent, but it's kind of like the new loophole, uh, you know, micro dot, right? But I'm going to put it in the ball you know, because some people are just panning the thing. Uh -huh. and, and I get it. But, you know, innovation is not easy. And you know, companies have a lot of damn if you do and damn if you don't. From the standpoint of, you know, if they introduce something that basically is like safe and makes a lot of sense, but it's not really innovative, it's like, oh, great. You know, here we go again. Another Glock or another bolt action or whatever. And they get panned uh -huh. for that. Right? It's be different. They try something different. It's like, oh my God, a solution to a problem that doesn't exist. Why would you do that? So, you know, if you're a bolt action rifle company, you know, where do you go? You got to try something different. And, you know, straight poles are very popular in Europe. I mean, the blahs are, you know, I, I want to say it's the R93. I can't remember the exact model. Um, I think it's the R93, R you got the R8. Yeah. So, and, yeah. And they're, and, shooting, and they're shooting 33 Lapua Magnum with the R8s. Yeah, and and like I say, in the high high SR thirty, which is what the Savage looks like, it's you know borrowed a lot of technology from. So it's been very popular in Europe. They do the driven board drives, and you know speed of getting shots on target probably mm -hmm. matters. So um, you know, will it be a failure? I don't know. We'll see. I think I think it'll depend on, to a large extent how they market it. You know, yeah. they market it not just with the speed advantage, but with any sort of strength advantage in the action. Um, you know, we'll see. The American, the American market is interesting. It's always it's always like that quick action follow up shot, whether it's pump actions, lever actions, uh, you know, uh -huh. semi autos. Like how many, you know, Remington used to sell almost all of their pump actions, seven sixty and seven six hundreds. I only have to uh, in now, so, so, you know, deer drives and quick so, shots. I mean, and putting my, I was it putting my financial thinking hat on. One of the questions I would have is. Are they actually going to grow the market, or are they going to be cut, basically transferring sales from a 110 or an Axis to their straight pull? I mean, that would be the question I have. Yeah, but at the, at the price point they offered, I would say they're. I would say that I would say they're going to get incremental sales. Yeah, because I mean it's. It's just me, but I mean, I would think that a guy, if a guy's interested in a five to, you know, a you know, literally a three hundred to a, you know, six hundred dollars Savage hunting rifle, yeah, he's probably not going. Gee, do I want that six hundred dollars Savage or do I want their twelve hundred dollars straight? Pull? So, just, I mean, it's just my opinion, but I think they've priced it high enough that it should be incremental sales. Now, does anyone know, like, can it? You is it the same um, footprint as their existing? Uh, is it the same footprint as their existing? Access or 110, or is this going to be basically yet another footprint if somebody wants a custom stock for it? No idea. Um, from what I could see from the videos, it looks like it's going to be a different inlet. Okay. From the way... I mean, that's gonna be... And it may, have been it may have been necessary from obviously a you know, mechanical geometry standpoint. If they yeah. chose to give it a different footprint, I would be unhappy. <laughs> to be honest with you, I honestly see somebody... I give it I don't know, six to eight months, I give somebody that much time to see if they're going to bring this rifle into the PRS world. Because if this thing, if you can load it as fast as they say it, you can, yeah. and pro like I said before, no one's released any information on the barrel inlet yet on if it's going to be the proprietary thread or the standard 110, but give somebody time, somebody's going to get into a chassis and run it into a PRS rifle, and they're going to... Someone's going to someone's gonna try it for sure, just to be different. Oh, yeah. Um, the question is, I mean, I mean, even in the PRS world, 
it's like, oh, how much faster is it going to be to load? And is that going to make any time difference? Is that going to add up to enough time difference to actually get you a couple of places higher? And I don't know. I mean, well, look, for example, like in a USP, like if this was applied to the handgun world, yes. Uh, if you can load, if you can reload faster, yes. I mean, that's what people practice. But like in the PRS world, I mean, I think there's like more dead time waiting for the wind or whatever. Well, I guess when you when you got to think about it is there's so many different degree angles for bolt action rifles because you got 60 degree yeah. bolt, you got 90, you got 70s and stuff like that. So, yeah. 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 So it, it's I think it's going to it's going to play into something like that. And for somebody who wants something faster or maybe somebody who has a disability in their wrist or something and can't flip the bolt up or whatever fast enough, this might actually be the uh, end all issue for them um, or the fix, I should say. So yeah. it, it's going to be interesting to see where this plays out. Um, honestly, for when it comes to the hunting world, I've seen people around here spend two, three grand on a rifle. So working in the industry, um, doing sales, I mean, you got Furies, you got uh, Kimber, you've got Christensen Arms. They're all in the fifteen hundred to three thousand dollar market. Yep. This is just something where Savage is like, "Hey, this is our niche, and they want a piece of the pie." I guess we'll have to see how strong it is. It'll be interesting. I mean, once actual once actual rifles and not media samples are in people's hands, we'll mm -hmm. be able to see. Well, I applaud them for trying something different. Like I say, I mean, it's you know, rather than just saying, "Well, we just made another another bolt action like everybody else, and we want fifteen hundred for it." I mean, you know, got to mm -hmm. do something differentiated to stand out from the crowd. All right. Um, so there's a question that is in my neck of the woods <laughs> are you guys having good luck with six millimeter gas guns any accuracy and consistencies i'm having good luck with mine um so both um six millimeter arc is inherently an accurate cartridge partly because of the design and it uses six millimeter bullets um the inaccurate the there are some barrels that don't shoot as well as others but i think a lot of it's going to be related more to twist rates um so Sammy spec is for one and seven and a half. There are some barrel makers who are going with a one and eight. And if you're shooting one and eight with a heavier grain bullet at sea level in colder conditions, it's going to be marginally stable. Um, so you have to take that into consideration. And I will be testing that. I have two six millimeter arc guns built right now. I have two more barrels, two or three more barrels. And uh, <laughs> before we go into the bolts, so we'll take a look at that, but that's me. Derek, you haven't built your six arc yet, right? No, actually, I've been really thinking about maybe building a six GT <laughs> gas gun because I got I'm working on that six GT project bolt gun right now. So I don't know. I thought about doing a six GT gas gun just to see if it works. Uh, let me answer this question as well. Is there another brass can be necked down to have some six five PRC brass or worst for, for worst case scenario? Yes. Um, so the parent cartridge is 300 Ruger. Well, parent cartridge is a 375 Ruger and then the neck down 300 Ruger compact Magnum, um, six, five PRC is cut down from that. You can also use 300 PRC and trim that. Uh, but there is a good amount of brass that's coming in. And I believe there is another Swedish caliber or one of those Norwegian up there. Um, that it's based off of that you can trim that brass. Uh, so yes, there are alternatives for worst case. Did not know this. Mm -hmm. Cool. All right, continue. Carry on. Um, but no, the six arc. I'm still interested in doing one. Um, I've just got other projects I'm working on right now. Uh, oh, so also, also for Sean just picked up a T T3X 300 Wisdom. I want to get a modular chassis for it for sure. I favor short actions. I actually have no experience with the short mag. Guess out west. Okay, so I it's a good little cartridge. It's a good cartridge. Um, honestly, I, I read an article a couple months back saying that the Winchester Model seventy and a three hundred short was a was a good action to have to, if you were going to do a. 6.5 PRC. Hmm. 
Interesting. Interesting. Yeah, so it's one interesting one. So usually, so 6.5 PRC is a little bit of a longer cartridge. It's kind of like in between and accurate had to make separate mags for it. Uh, but it ran think, quite well in the sta in the standard Mossberg short action. I was like, fit pretty well. So, video on. next week. Uh, and then so going back to the Savage, lawyers wouldn't let them release it if it was relatively safe. I don't know. Is that true? Yes. 100%. <laughs> or we just release it and then we'll see how it is. Highly unlikely. Yeah. Oh, so I don't think Savage is like SIG. I wasn't talking about SIG, but yes, SIG. Taurus. <laughs> yeah, so no, it's high point. <laughs> now, high points don't blow up in your face. It's the other ones that do. <laughs> high point is just a high point, but they're relatively reliable and they're pretty safe. Let's give credit where credit is due. Uh, uh, and Roger on the brass, perfect. Yeah, no, so that was like, it was interesting. Like, I like the straight pull actions in the uh, Schmiff Rubens. I have to take a look at that other Heim. 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 Uh, Heim. SR30. SR30. That's going to be interesting. But like I said, like, the ball bearings is kind of like, as soon as I saw it, the first thing that came to my mind is those ball bearings popping out and like being somewhere in the thing uh matt i think your camera froze up or your battery finally died right row i'll let you remove that unless you want to, unless you're done and you have to go and you have your mandate no no i i rescheduled that i'm just not sure why i uh everything's actually working here but huh try me look at that i'm back there we go there we go so yeah so I, I I think I'm probably it's it's interesting. I can uh, I'm almost done. I have a Savage 110 and 65 PRC. That's going to be the next video after the Mossberg, and I'm like I have a next one already picked out uh, after that. But I'm like now I'm thinking like should I ask for this one instead? But like I I'm really excited about the other one that are, that's I'm already on the list for. I'm really excited about that. Derek knows what it is. I do. What do you think? Um, I think it's going to be a good gun. Honestly, I was looking at it last night and looking. I'm like, I don't need another Lapua, but hmm. I might need a 37 XC. That could be interesting. Oh, so yeah, and basically, uh, Matt doesn't know this yet, but actually, I think I told you. Uh, one of my plans for this year, thanks to Derek. Uh, well, so Derek got, us, got the whole thing started with, hey, we should go shoot two to two miles. And then I started looking at him. Well, King of Two Miles here gets filled up really quick, but yeah. not in Russia. And uh, so I'm making plans to go shoot King of One Mile and King of Two Mile in uh, Moscow um, in June. No shit. Yeah. Want to come? I'd love to. <laughs> we can chat. Um, but no, so that that would actually be really good. And at least the King, they're both winnable. Um, so one of the guns that's going to be coming up is going to be basically built for that. If we're, so for King of One Mile, it's going to be a 300 PRC. I'm like 99% set on that. Yeah. Uh, but for, for King of Two to attempt it, still debating between uh, the shy Tex or the 416. You should really look into the 37 XC. I was really doing some heavily research last okay. night. And what is that based off of? It's actually the cartridge diameter is actually a Lapua cartridge diameter and cartridge bolt face. Okay. It's just it's a very long cartridge. It's like four point six inches. Really? Cartridge okay. overall length. Um look into it. David Tubbs designed it. He's out of Texas. Yeah. Well he shot it. I think he shot the thirty seven XC in it. Yeah, he holds the Cold Bore record right now in the States at twenty twenty two hundred and 21 miles, no, 21, 2222 yards or something like that. Cold bore, uh, three shot group. Um, uh, so Drew, yes, and that's primarily the the point. I talked to the match organizer and he's really excited about that. Uh, we'll see if the Russian government is excited about that, <laughs> you know, but it's actually easier for 
Americans to go to Russia than it is for people who were born in the former Soviet Union. Um, but we'll see on that. And then, Matt, here's a question for you. Does Choate make a stock for left hand Savage 110 Tactical? All the models I see don't support the AICS mags. That is a very good question. I don't know the answer. Um, I mean, I know they make them for the left hand Savage. I mean, I, I, I mean, I've got a left handed Savage that I've gotten a Choate stock. Um, I don't know. So I will uh, I will try to post something on the Choate social media about that if I can. Okay. Um, and then Al, you basically, you know how to find me. Uh, so Matt's going to get me an answer as well. I'll get, I'll get to have an answer. Um, and we'll do that. So, you know, a, on our Discord server. So, yes, Slav Guns has a Discord server as well. Um, the, okay, so I answered that. Uh, yeah, so basically part of it, so I am talking to a company, uh, possibly using Verchassi. Um, so they would kind of help offset that trip, so as a sponsor. Um, so the entire premise, I mean, I'd want to go kind of to share the experience of what it's like. And uh, one of the goals is possibly for later this year, as soon as the Wu flu is done with, um, to kind of go around the at least the United States or hopefully the world shooting different type of matches to kind of give you experience a lot of it as a first timer, what it's like to do that. Um, Great. I just thought that was, that would be awesome. I and I get to go around and shoot. It does. Well, I could say what um, September they're doing an NRL match in Utah that Aaron from um, Anarchy Outdoor sponsors. Wait, what does he sponsor? The uh, Utah Barrel Burner competition. Oh. And then the weekend after that is the Badland Steel Challenge out okay. in uh, North Dakota. Look at this. We have more people joining. A Canadian wants to make fun of us and what's happening with our government. Hello, Alex. Oh, hey, guys. I just joined in to troll you a little bit. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> it it's <is> okay. <laughs> So here, let's ask you, are you excited for the Savage Synergy? Wait, that's what they call it. Impulse. 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 Yeah, I think it's the Impulse. Um, I mean, yes, I want to see just how quickly you can, like, uh, throw this for, like throw rounds in and out of that thing. I'm just, uh, I mean, I, like, I was listening to you guys earlier. No. I was listening to you guys earlier, and I mean, yeah, those ball bearings. I mean, I'm just thinking, like, those that doesn't look like a very solid action that's going to stay in one place. I mean, they're going to continue wearing themselves backwards into the receiver or I don't know, just from my, my thoughts about it sooner or later, it's going to give you a longer headspace. And I mean, that's my initial thoughts, but obviously, I mean, they've tested this thoroughly. So what Hopefully. do I, know? Hopefully they've tested it a <laughs> lot. No, but you know what it is? Like, I'm just trying to remember a couple of guns that like they, they rush to release it. And like, it seems like it's a really good idea in theory and then like once it starts going practical applications it's like oh okay and that's when they start discovering the actual issues uh, and by the way so uh alex affordable optics and derek northwest gun reviewers they have youtube channels so they'll put them in chat go hit them up they do put out interesting stuff um the one warning is uh alex the, affordable optics is no longer really about affordable optics <laughs> Bubbles, okay, you know that's not true that's not, that's not true in like a few weeks i'm actually <laughs> gonna be releasing the uuq and i mean it's better than any loophole you've ever seen the uuq 4 to 12 by 50 tactical this thing has rails on the scope itself i mean you can't make this up it's got a red dot laser on the top a laser on the side and i brought it out to 750 meters just because you know i was like Let's 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 challenge ourselves a little bit just for the hell of it. And we did it. Like we've been slamming that steel. I mean, not that you could really tell your hits on steel. I mean, you could hear it, and I mean I could kind of tell the dark smudge, but you know what? It did it. <laughs> Giving loophole the run for its money, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Alex, tell him the best part, how much of a val how good of a value it is. Uh well, the turrets are about um, the, an MOA on this scope is about about 0.8 of an actual. So it's like 0.8 of an actual to, to an MOA. So it's a little bit under. So you can't base yourselves on any uh, ballistic charts. It's just 
way off. Uh, I think I was double. It. You don't need it because it has a laser. <laughs> it has a. Oh my god! It has a freaking laser. I mean, what? It, and I mean, I was using a six point five Creedmoor, and I mean, those things they so flat shooting, no bullet drop whatsoever. I tell you. And, and how did you pick this one? Because it's the best seller on Amazon, right? I thought, you know what? What the hell? If everybody's buying it, I got to see just how damn good this thing is. And I mean, <laughs> wow. it's something all right. I mean, glass is pretty terrible. Uh, turrets, they actually feel really sharp, but I have a feeling that they're like probably plastic internal. So they'll probably last for a couple months and then they'll just crack or something. And Until you at least sight it in, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I got it sighted in. I didn't put on 308, just a 6.5. <laughs> <laughs> so 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 here's the question: Are you gonna? What are you gonna give it for the reliability rating for the re, for recoil management? I mean, I'm gonna throw it on my. I don't know. Uh, I'm, I'm probably. I don't know how many rounds I want to waste through this thing. I'm just gonna mention X amount of rounds or through it. Recommended for 22 to do what you want, but you know to challenge yourself. Well, you know what? We, we're always using these fancy scopes, like between 600 and 1,000 and and plus. But maybe the real challenge is using sixty dollars scopes at a thousand. Hmm? So we'll, we'll, we'll make that a, we'll make that a group challenge to go shoot a thousand yards with a two thousand dollar gun, but no more than a hundred dollars on an optic. Oh, I really like this uh, this challenge. I mean, I'm already pretty much there. So, <laughs> hey Suave, I do got a clock off. Thank but, you, Matt. Uh, Th Matt, thank you for joining us. Hey, thank you for having me, and good to see you, gentlemen. I'm sure we will see you down the road, but uh, carry on. Thank you, sir. Thank you. See Take you. care. Gay, our screens get bigger now <laughs> after we kick Matt out. <laughs> so that is uh, no. Uh, when I saw the videos on it, so I had a similar one of those. Um, I touched it, and the front objective fell off man <laughs> and they all look the same so there's a bunch of companies oh, i guess it's, so it's, it's like my sight mark spotting scope i have <laughs> i think it's better <laughs> no so it's like and it's amazing you know like so we were kind of uh so it's not a secret so i mean i have my amazon shop set up i think alex is working on his uh and our friend steven already has his set up and we're kind of going through so when you're sorting out a lot of the optics sorted by what's most popular meaning the number of sales it's not the loophole mark 5 hds i mean you're not going to get to like an aflon until like at least 30 and like even those like even like out of the i'd say out of the real brands uh i think the vortex diamond the crossfire is one of the scopes that's kind of high up out there on the list but it's mostly a lot of no-name chinese brands that none of us actually review yeah, like the UUQ. I mean, I think it had like a but thousand. People buy them. That's the thing, though. Like a lot of people buy them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you got to get one. I'm telling you. I, I can't wait for the review. I can't <laughs> wait for the review on that, Alex. I'm just so impressed that I actually hit. Like, I even I think I even have a four inch gong that I actually hit. I mean, mostly. I hit it through just sheer volume because, I mean, it's yeah. four inches at 700 meters, and that's, like, less than an MOA. I yep. was slamming an eight-inch gong actually pretty consistently, and my reticle just covers the whole, like, eight inches at 750. And, I mean, I was hitting it, like, every time. I was, like, pretty impressed. And, I mean, I have a giant 24-inch by 24-inch gong that, I mean, I use just because, you know, you know what the best thing to do for, for practicing for long range isn't necessarily the optic but the target. I used to use like a six inch by about eight inch target. I had like two of those set at like 600 meters and you miss a couple times until finally by chance, you know, you're testing your holdovers. Okay. Hold up and left, hold right in the, um, and so much until you finally get it. And you know how many rounds I've wasted just doing that until I finally spent 200 bucks on a 24 inch by 24 inch gong. And, Oh, look, I'm high and right. Do a little correction. Bam. Let's hit the little steel now. Yep. So here's a question. Did it pass your turret tracking test? Did you do a box test on it? Uh, actually, you don't want it, to find out. The So I, I put it on my, my, my setup here, and I'm, it's at 50 yards. And the focus parallax is set to 100, and at 50, it's pretty blurry. Okay. So the it, it's, it looks like it just passes a little bit. You can tell that it passes 
the mar or no, it doesn't quite meet the markers uh, quite. So it's, you, you know, obviously that it's under. And I mean, from shooting at 750, I knew right away that it was under what it should be. So uh, it returns to zero. Does it track? No. And I mean, like I said, I think the, the turrets and in the internals are probably made of some kind of plastic that sooner or later will become brittle and, and break. And, you know, it, it might be great for a 22 when you set it yeah. and forget it. But if you want to dial, I mean, I don't think this would be a great idea for long term use. Hey, I'm impressed that it survived, really. <laughs> well, I only have it on a 6.5 Creedmoor, too. It's not like I got it on a, a huge 308, you know. <laughs> Oh, 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 oh. So, Alex, this is for you. Oh. <laughs> so, and um, so a little bit of background to this. So, Alex is in Canada and he's unable to get a lot of the scopes. So, what we do is he sends them to me, some of them I get to play with, and then I send it to him. Um, and this was basically the case with the Arkin Aflon and the tracked 30 millimeter. Um, but before this, this wasn't the first set of scopes. Before this, we had uh, two Monstrums and the Rudolph. Uh, yeah. The Rudolph was actually fine, but he had Monstrum. So I kind of played with them, and it seemed to be okay. And then I sent them to you, and then what happened with those? Well, uh, we have the Monstrum, uh, the G3. Uh, so... We were, we, you, we were shooting at 500 meters, whatever, no problem. I realized the turrets might have been a little bit off for the tracking. And when I, I finally, I was I didn't do it on my target here in the backyard. I just did it on the target itself at 100 yards. And for, for three, um, five MOA right, it was close. And when I did five MOA, MOA left from our center, it wasn't even on the sheet. So I'm thinking like, where the hell did you go? And I have another like, four or five MOA beyond that on the left. So, I mean, the error range, that's not 15%. This is more like 200% error, at least on the windage, somewhere in there. And for the elevation on that specific model, we had about a 15% over what it should be. So, yeah. I mean, sometimes the budget optics, you, you can't, like the ballistic charts are useless. It's going to really come down to not knowing your, your, your gun, knowing your scope, knowing the scope's tracking. So, yeah. You'll have to like What's going on? work your way to 200. Okay, I know I'm, you know, two MOA on this scope and, uh, you know, back yourself at 300, 400. And you could still do okay, provided you know the scope, which it really isn't ideal. Because, I mean, I've, I've done a lot of testing on a lot of cheap scopes. And like I mentioned earlier, I had a lot of misses. But a lot of that is largely due to incorrect tracking. Yeah. So, <laughs> so if, if like uh, the, like I use the, uh, what is it called? The Kestrel Elite, uh, 5700 Elite. And it doesn't matter what that says. If your scope's tracking is off, you'll be way off. And if yeah. you're shooting in the grass, like I do most of the time, um, you're just going to be wasting countless ammo. And I, I've probably wasted over a thousand dollars worth of ammo just shooting in the dirt, not knowing where I'm hitting. And this is why I, why I bought the 24 inch by 24 inch gone. To yeah. save money <laughs> and probably the best investment i've done so far there you go yeah. so it seems like basically with the chinese scopes it's like they might work but if you're gonna put them put them on the gun that you're not gonna adjust the turrets ideally i'd say a two two three and less and not a well i don't know about an air 15 how it is for recoil but like the wk 180c which is another one of stoner eugene stoner's designs which canadians are currently manufacturing uh it has this really odd recoil that just rattles the piss out of a lot of scopes so uh, i killed a cheap scope on it and so i'd say you know what a 223 and less recoil fine but anything above that you're it's it's a gamble of when is it gonna bust yeah there you go. Interesting. No, so it was the Monstrum is not the one that had um, the Monstrum is not the one that had um, cease turrets. It was the Arkan. Yeah, uh, we had an issue. It was a Gen One though. It was the Gen One. They had uh, the turrets. Essentially, the turrets turned fine, but the reticle inside it was it was stopped moving. So not too sure okay. what that is. Interesting. There you go. All righty. So. I've been on for two hours and 44 minutes.
when I plan for just an hour. You getting tired? A little bit. No, it, I want to know what's going on in the, in our nation's capital and uh, whether I should start putting on my bulletproof vest. <laughs> I'm safe. I'm a little far away from there right now. We're You're a little good. bit further away. You're in a place where it doesn't matter anyway. True. There you go. Awesome. All right. Any other thoughts, gentlemen? Holy hell. Um. I don't know. I'm wondering how one of those uh, Monstrum tactical scopes would last on a Lapua. I don't know. <laughs> the mount is actually okay. Um, I forgot the one I forgot to send you. Uh, yeah, it's a, yeah. I played with the mount and it's there, but it, it's amazing how popular Monstrum scopes are and a lot of them are, even though they might not be good scope. They had great packaging. They had great hmm. packaging. Hmm. Well, uh, that's them still uh, shopping for is good scope for the Lapua for the build coming up. Well, you are right you are Mr. Blackhound, and well now you're Mr. Right on. <laughs> yep, I just just got um, accepted the pro staff program for Right on. So, but I've been shooting Right on scopes for what almost a year and a half, two years now. So I've never had an issue with them. Yeah. No, I had the right on RTS Mod 3 Gen 2, their old series before they discontinued it. And regardless that it was a bit of a modest, like modest in features, it had, I think, 3.3 inches of eye relief, 40 MOAs worth of internal adjustment on a $300 scope. Um, it had actually pretty clear glass and uh, positive turrets and tracking on the same thing. I think it was a second focus no, plan. Regardless, it was quite mm -hmm. uh, The one thing that bugged the hell out of me out of that Monstrum. Uh, the big one is like it just the design on it, it just looked wacky like it was like had that square thing in the middle where it should be just like a nice beautiful bell housing it just looked wacky <laughs> like, it looks wrong i mean but the turrets on that thing felt like really really nice i mean it yeah, just they were it was, regardless of how they feel the internal mm, whatever <laughs> or you know i may have just got a lemon i don't know we'll see later I'm like looking at what other scopes exactly. I have here to play with, but for all there's a latitude. Well, that crimson trace. So we're gonna have a video on that crimson trace scope soon. That's not a bad scope. I like it. Although I really like Element Optics. I mean, I've played with, like I said, playing more, spending more time with the Titan. I was fairly impressed with it. I was like, I really like that scope. Yeah. And then the, well, only, the only thing I find with the Element, though, I mean, everything on it is really, really nice. The turrets are really nice and positive. They have a little bit of stiffness to them. Um, the focus parallax, you know, it's really well graded between like pretty much 0, 10, 20, 30, 50, mm -hmm. uh, 70, 100, 125, 150, and then 200, 250, and 500. It goes like really, yep. really, has a really, really tight margin for the actual long range shooter. I mean, then yeah, again, I, it was designed for air gunners, which. Yeah, I think uh, that's partly why it is because it's, it's, it's showing the history of the air gunning wherever yeah. it's spending more time up front. But. So I mean I haven't taken out long range, um, but I had like I said playing around with it here, looking out to like past three four hundred yards, I haven't had issues with it. So it's gonna be an interesting question for him, or if he took care of that within des within the design. Yeah, no, I was using that one. I used it on the Tika T three X two two three review that we just finished. Uh, oh, right here, seven hundred and fifty meters, and the glass quality is really nice. It's just a little bit uh, fine tuning to get the focus just right for the distance. It, yeah. That's the only thing I kind of think that, you know what, it, it, it's not really targeted towards us long range shooters though. It's more targeted towards everybody is doing a lot of ballistic drop between, you know what, 25 and 250. Yeah. I like I said, and the one I'm really excited about is, so we're gonna, we're gonna get the Helix here very soon. Yeah, they the just came focal. up with a new first focal plane yep. variant of the-, uh, of the That's old. the one we're giving away. So you can enter the giveaway and maybe you'll get it quicker than from them <laughs> uh, and then the track 34 millimeter that's an awesome scope that's gonna go on that gun very shortly i will say one scope i am and i'm not saying this because i'm a right on pro staff member or fanboy now um, is, is the right on which the, one <laughs> the one i just bought i'm doing i'm working on the review for is the x3 conquer 6 to 24 by 50 that is actually been a it's a really nice scope um we have it on the 
Savage 110 Precision on the 6.5 Creedmoor. And, I mean, hitting 500 yards with that scope is, is nothing. It's easy. Um, the reticle's really nice on it. The glass is clear. I mean, for a sub $1,000 scope that's in the, if I think MSRP is like the 650 mark, <laughs> you're definitely getting a lot of features that you see in the more expensive ones. Oh, so Alex, you had experience with both of these scopes as well. So somebody had an earlier question, Element Titan versus Strike Eagle. And it's going to be very close and similar, but I kind of like edged it out to the Titan for the better turrets. Um, yeah, the turrets, I mean, they're still pretty damn positive on the, the Strike Eagle, but um, hmm, I'd say probably the glass, I think, is slightly brighter on the uh, Titan and maybe a little bit clearer. I still, I'd, I'd have to compare them side by side, but from memory, I believe the element might be have a little bit better glass marginally, though. Yeah. And like and I shot the element yesterday and like it was like very dark conditions, like crappy shooting conditions, and it did really well. Mm -hmm. I was like really impressed with it. But yeah. yeah. Cool. Well, like, and I don't have the strike eagle anymore because I dropped it and the eyepiece broke. But no, I, it's possible that my sample was a little bit different. But uh I say unless weight is an issue, go with the Titan because I mean the Titan is thirty eight or thirty nine ounces versus the strike eagle, which is only like thirty or thirty two. Yeah. So that's the only one. All right. So I am. Any other closing thoughts? And otherwise, I'm going to wrap this up. Yeah. No, that's what I'm aware of. Um, I was. Right. Oh, actually, I was going to say one scope I do want to get in. Um, and Dark Lord of Octopus recommended this because that fits in with the Strike Eagle and the Titan is the one from Swamp Fox. I believe it's the Warhawk or the War or something like that. So I'm trying to get one of those in right now. Cool. That's going to be interesting. So that's another Swamp Fox is one of those other newer companies. And yeah. I think Alex found another newer company. So like I said it's cool that there's so many other companies, even though there's only a couple of OEMs. Mm -hmm. um, Alex, so there's a question for you. So here, why don't you guys finish us off with tell us where to find you and your channels. So let's start with Derek. Um, you can find me on YouTube on Northwest Gun Reviewers. You can find me on Instagram, Parlor. You can find me on LinkedIn now. Um, just started that account just about a week ago. And you can find me on uh, the new social media network called MeWe, which I'm trying out right now. Cool. All right. And Mr. Not So Affordable Optics? <laughs> Legally only, which has been the last like eight months. We've been reviewing optics on the $100 price point or and a thousand. Uh, you can find us on uh, YouTube, Affordable Optics and Rifle Reviews. We're like one of the first ones to come up. You've probably seen one of our reviews at some point. Um, we are on Instagram, but we're not really, you know, active at all. Uh, we're fairly active on Facebook, on our group and in our page. If you uh, ever wanted to join, you know, we discuss optics and we discuss the next reviews we're going to do. Uh, in the future, we're planning on to do the best of the uh, entry level semi-automatic rimfire so i've actually bought every single one of them for a uh, versus review that is exciting that is actually i'm looking forward to that yeah so you actually you bought all of them okay and you bought all of them uh i have pretty much everyone that's below like 400 um wow. i'm working on the individual wow. reviews which were um i think we got like four or five left and I just bought the Mossberg Blaze. I had to overpay just because they're out of stock everywhere. Uh, but I managed to negotiate myself about three pounds of lamb in the deal because the guy sells lamb. <laughs> I told him, listen, bud, you're asking too much. I'll give you 200. He was asking 250 for a Mossberg Blaze. Those things are worth like 100 bucks. Well, 150 bucks Canadian. Anyway, he's, he's like, no, the best I'll do is 220. I'm like, tell you what. I, you know, he told me, tell you what, I'll give you some lamb and, and 250. And I'm like, all right, you whatever, give me whatever lamb you want to give me, and I'll take the gun. So I got the gun, two uh, high-capacity magazines and uh, the Mossberg Blaze. Yeah, so I'm pretty excited. I haven't even shot that thing yet. Um, we're actually still working on, well, we had defects in some of the semi-automatics because I bought all of these 22. None of these are, are testing and evaluation. <laughs> They're all just bought out of pocket because I didn't really feel like waiting on companies to send me stuff and then having time frames and stuff. So I was just like, you know what, yeah. screw it. I'll buy it. And if I sell it at a loss, so what? And uh, we're having issues with the Savage 64F. And I'm telling you, this is my second Savage 64F. And they are some of the worst. 
constant failures to fire. Like I have, I have bought a sonic cleaner just so I could clean this thing as cleanly as humanely possible. And guess what? One round through it, the next round, click. What the heck is that? What is that? I don't know. So anyway, that one's got to go back. And this is my second one. I've owned one like four years ago. Nothing but issues. Um, so yeah, <laughs> I haven't had the a good success. Things you do for YouTube. Before. Hey, the things you do for YouTube. Yeah, the sacrifice. Mm -hmm. That one in the Marlin Seven Ninety Five, which I'm like, people say it's reliable. Not so much for me. Hmm. Maybe it's the Canadian ammo that you're shooting through it. Oh. I would. Hey, hey, I, I buy Ely in the Fancy Boy stuff, okay? Yes, you do. Yeah. Damn right. <laughs> Better than me, I don't even shoot the fancy stuff out of the 22s. I just buy the bulk. I mean, I used to just buy the bulk, but people were complaining that, oh, either you suck, yeah. your scope sucks, or your gun yeah. sucks. So which one is it? And I'm like, shit, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I contacted the Castro, and I'm like, you know what, send me a sample pack, and I tested all the ammunition through it until mm -hmm. I found one that, you know, grouped really, really nice and tight. And so yeah. that's what we've been representing on our rimfire reviews. And I mean, that's pretty much what you got to do. The bulk stuff will probably yield you like at best an inch and a half group at 50 and at worst about four inches at 50. So I kind of had to do it for the review. It's expensive as hell, but Hey, it's like a hundred bucks of the, uh, maybe like 50 bucks of ammo through for every uh, rimfire have to do. Yeah. So um, Drew had a comment. Uh, yup, he's Canadian. Based on your A? Eh? Uh, I will say, though, so I met Alex uh, at SHOT Show. We got together, convinced him to go to SHOT Show last year. And he's the most pro-American Canadian that you're going to find. He's like Mr. America. <laughs> My friends call me Captain America, but it's yes. just a joke. I, I would help sponsor your visa if I could. All right. <laughs> And on that lovely note, gentlemen, thank you for joining me. You're welcome. And you. I think we should probably do this on a weekly basis. Uh, we'll try. So we got to keep uh, it shorter than like three hours, though. I mean, I can't yeah. do three hours. I can edit, man. Well, no. So we already had. We already had. See, this is why it's lasting three hours, is because like the questions and stuff come up. Uh, no, we already had the pre-recorded. Well, not the pre-recorded part. The stuff they actually wanted to discuss, and I was planning. The pre-work was it? <laughs> yes. And now this is just the chatty chat stuff. Um, but you no, know, the goal is so YouTube is rolling out a new feature where you can go straight from a live chat into a premiere. So that's what I'm hoping. As soon as that's launched, what we'll do is we'll do a live chat before our regular monday videos and i think we'll look like so we're going to do mondays plus wednesdays or monday wednesday friday depending on how it is and uh so we'll do that so we'll keep you guys up to date uh we did draw the winner congratulations to the winner again he will be contacted by matt and uh i shall have a video on friday uh taking a look at continuing our quick videos uh looking at the loophole mark 5 hd and then we have a really exciting month. So on Monday, I will have a video on the Mossberg Patriot in 6.5 PRC. And we'll soon hopefully have a couple of new, a new optic from Helix. Um, I am on the wait list to get a long-term sample of the Arkin SH4 Gen 2. So I've already done a video on with Alex's. So Alex, thank you. Oh, and look like my second battery died, but... I'm not going to go change it now. So, Alex, thank you very much for <laughs> letting me play with it. No and problem. hopefully in the next couple of weeks, I'll have this new Sierra 6 BDX from SIG. And I'm really excited about that. Uh, so the order is in. Hopefully, we'll get it very, very soon. So on that note, thank you, Derek. Thank you, Alex. Thank you for joining us. Uh, You're welcome. Drew, John, everybody else who's participated in chat, thank you very much, guys. And I will see you in the next video. See you on the next one. See you next one. Okay.